Okay, so this is a long time in the making. I'm very happy to be here. Um, my name is DRC Neal. I am a second year PhD student at The Ohio State University. Um, and I study blackness and disability as well as like Afrofuturism. And we are so very blessed to have this wonderful panel of people here with us today. Uh, this is something that I put together, I call it of uh, Eight Flavors of Blackness, uh, a conversation on modern Black creative representation. And um, I've invited a couple of my friends here to speak on this um, because I think it's a really important topic that, you know, in the era of Black Lives Matter and all of these things that is happening, I was like, this is a really timely discussion that I think um, is both really important and super relevant. Um, so, on the panel, uh, I've got my friend Shashimba Shisala. Uh, she has been in education for 12 years. She holds the roles of teacher, lecturer, co-coordinator, and head of department for English. Um, she is based out of London, England, and she previously worked in the UK publishing industry for four years before moving into education. Um, she is my really good friend, and we did our master's together uh, when we lived in London. Um, next up, my friend Leticia is a writer, actress, filmmaker, and anti-racism educator. She is a graduate of NYU, and her goal is to create stories in film and television that are entertaining, impactful, and highlight the importance of community. So that's Leticia. Uh, my friend Christopher Gonzalez is an associate professor of English and the founding director of the Latinx Cultural Center at Utah State University. He has published many books on narratives by and about marginalized communities in the US and is currently finishing two books on Latinx representation in speculative cinema. Uh, that's Chris Gonzalez. And lastly, my friend JC is the leader and founder of the, the Gamer Allied People of Color, a social media group that is dedicated to introducing gamers in the LGBTQ plus diaspora from a cultural perspective. Uh, through this network, almost 2,000 gay homosexual men of color have come together to share in the safe space and that it is consistently growing. So that is JC. So now what I'm gonna do is give each panelist a couple of minutes to talk about the work that they do uh, and their kind of areas, um, just so we have an introduction to the topic. And yeah, essentially this, uh, webcast is going to be a conversation, just kind of an open conversation, and I've got some guiding questions that come in toward the end. So first, uh, we'll start with Dr. Gonzalez. All right, thank you, DRC and everyone. It's good to be here. Um, just a little bit about me and my work. Um, you know, since I was a little kid, I, I was, uh, probably like many people here, uh, just fascinated with uh, sci-fi fantasy uh, uh al alternate realities right that that were different from my own um and yet i felt very keenly the absence of people of color in so many um stories that i read and so many films and television shows that i watched um as i as i you know matured and and, and pursued education uh in, in these in these uh, areas of literature um i returned back to speculative narratives uh, in, in, in particular um, because they seem to me to be like the low-hanging fruit for where we can see diverse representation. I mean, we, 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 can, we can have green-skinned aliens uh, easily, right? Um, and even uh, non-human representation of, of extraterrestrials. And yet it, we're, we're still um, confounded and confronted with the issue of representation in an area of storytelling that should be very open to it. Um, I find that to be a kind of a paradox, but also revealing of the systemic racism and white supremacy that dominates uh, storytelling in particular in my area in the United States. Um, 
And so in uh, researching my, um, my particular field, which is narrative theory, I've, I've, I've tried to carve out uh, a theory that I call narrative permissibility, uh, which essentially says that there are certain, or I should say, not all narratives have the same permission to exist. Um, and so when people point to, well, why aren't there more Latinx sci-fi novels? Or why aren't there more Latinx representation uh, in a sci-fi film? Um, I always, you know, come back to this idea of, well, what is allowed? What is allowable by the powers that be? And I know there are others here who are going to talk about the publishing industry, but, um, you know, that, that, is, that is something that motivates me. Uh, in my current work, I'm really interested in uh, Latinx visual representation because Latinx culture uh, really confounds the, you know, the conception that we have in the United States of, well, what I see is what you are, right? If you have dark skin, then you are X. Um, but Latinx is really defy that. You can have Latinxes that look Anglo. You can have them look like me or the mestizo brown version of Latinxes. You have, you have Afro Latinos and you have Latinos that look Asian. So um, how does that manifest in the visual, right? Where you can't just determine someone's ethnicity or race um, uh, or, or, or um, connection to Latinx culture in particular by looking at them. And you can't, you can't tell by their surname either, right? So, so I'm really interested in how Latinx culture is represented in these fantastical speculative spaces in the visual and in particular in cinema. So that's what's been motivating me lately. Um, and I'm, and I'm, I'm looking forward to this conversation. I was gonna say, as you were talking, all I could think of was uh, the like old school song from Trina where people would be like, you know, what is it? Chocolate, butter pecan, like, you know, like pecan brown, you know, it's like black folks used to always talk about all the different shades. And so, yeah, I definitely think that that's a really good point. Um, and I look forward to talking about it. Uh, next up is Shim. Um, basically, what we're talking about, just a quick introduction to the kind of work that you do and just like a quick way to introduce yourself to the, the people. Okay, so um, I did an English degree at university and I stumbled blind, dumb into publishing. I picked up a book one day and I thought, oh, this is nice. Maybe I'll go and do that because I had no idea what to do after university. Saw the name of the publisher on there. Um, sent a letter to them to see if there were any jobs and within six months I, I was working in publishing just as an assistant um, and didn't even really think anything of it when you're you know, looking for work even in somewhere as diverse as London you don't really um, or I'm not going to say that you forget but it's, it's, it's dominated by obviously one culture so it didn't faze me that I was the only one of my culture in there it's what I expected um, but it was interesting to see the dynamics of um, when different work came in, how that was treated and why we weren't having new and different work coming in in the four years I spent in publishing. Not once did I see something brand new from diverse authors come in. I think I saw reprints of Maya Angelou to death, but there was nothing else. Um, there was nothing else coming through. And then now when I retrained as a teacher 11 years ago, it's an even worse perspective seeing it in the classroom. So seeing what plays out in the classroom, I think it freaks my students out that I'm a black woman teaching them English literature. <laughs> um, and they kind of look at me as if to say, oh, that doesn't quite match up. And they want to know my experiences. They want to know the literature that interests me, but yet I'm standing there representing a completely different culture. So, so that's what interests me at the moment, that kind of weird dichotomy of my culture versus what I teach and versus what I'm, what I'm reading. Yeah, that is, I think, a, <laughs> I think that's something that <laughs> most black teachers have, have <laughs> with, um, because the, the education system really doesn't mesh with what we learn in school. Um, so yeah, I look forward to talking about that. Uh, next up, Leticia. Oh, you're actually muted, so. I am, okay, I'm back. <laughs> uh, hi everybody, I am already so excited to hear um, everyone's experience and where, they, where they're going with their work. Um, my background, uh, like I said, is uh, it's in filmmaking and theater. Um, I uh, studied as a screenwriter and playwright uh, in undergrad and then moved into educational theater. Um, 
uh, for my master's. And so going into the, uh, going into the theater space is kind of like where I, where I initially got my, um, a lot of my experience. In fact, um, I spent some time in London myself for our study abroad. So there was a lot of, uh, it was really interesting seeing, um, for me, the place or one of the places where our literary canon kind of comes from. So, you know, looking at that from that perspective was fascinating, but then also coming back to the work that we do in theater and trying to um, diversify what it means to uh, to be, you know, what is classic? You know, what is, what is canon? Whose canon are you talking about? Uh, both in film and in theater. Um, so my interest is really in telling, um, in telling those, those uh, stories from a variety of areas, but also um, one thing that has happened and it happens across all, uh, I think, media is that sometimes when we get an increase in diverse representation, kind of what's on the cover, so whether it's, you know, actors or, or you know, uh, diverse protagonists um, in media, just because those are the faces that are front doesn't mean those are the faces of the people who wrote the material or the faces of those who produced the material. And so you have this push for representation comes up front, but that it doesn't necessarily always translate in the creation. And so that's one of the things that interests me on not just how do we get faces in front of people, but how do we make sure that those faces are, um, have an authentic voice and um, have a voice that is representative of the culture that they present um, and in the diversity of said culture. So that's, that's kind of where one of the many places that I'm coming from. Yeah, I was going to say, I'm, I've got some questions in there that will definitely address that. So I look forward to your perspective, because uh, like I said, in the in the era of Black Lives Matter, oh, the question of whose face is getting shown what is is the real, that is the real question right now. Um, so yeah, I look forward to that. And then lastly, is Mr. JC. Uh, it, let me unmute you. I'm muted. Okay. Hi guys, um, just want to say I am very uh, humbly appreciative to be on this panel with you guys. Um, I feel like I don't fit next to all of these accolades, but I am very, um, um, I'm very grateful for this opportunity. I lead a social media group known as the Gamer Ally People of Color, and this group came about from me being in a lot of white controlled gay spaces when it came to entertainment, gaming, um, and I noticed that there was a certain um, it was just a, a certain, uh, I don't want to say it was hypersexual, but I do want to say it was just a narrative that catered to white people. It was not my experience. And I used to notice anytime I would push against the grain of the, oh, well, let me talk about what games I play, but let me post seven different selfies of myself shirtless. I found myself either being banned, kicked out, muted, you know, and it, it just became after a while, um, I sat with a couple of friends in a Facebook chat and they were just like, why don't you make your own group? And this was two and a half years ago. And I was just like, okay, I'll do that. So I did that. And um, our group blew, I think, maybe in three months to like 600 people. And people were posting all day. And they were just like, wow, we never had a group like this before and blah, blah, blah. And then before long, we were 1,000. And today, before even three years, we're at 2,000 people pushing out this activity and outreach that people with 10 or 11,000 you know, people in a group do. I think our outreach right now annually is at 500,000 between uh, uh, comments, reactions, and posts. So our network has really grown and gotten huge. And what I really want to introduce to um, the communities at large as we begin to grow and expand and think about, you know, stage presence nationally is what it is to be a gamer and a person of color and have that culture. We don't really experience um, in gaming, we don't really, uh, like when we talk about Storm and comics, for instance, I was talking about this the other day, we go to a, a you know, a, a gathering with just us, and we talk about Storm, and we stand, and oh, she's the goddess, she's the queen, blah, 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 and then we even get into deeper, you know, conversations about, you know, whether or not Storm suffered from self-hate when she married Black Panther, because Wakanda was a mutant-hating nation, you know, these are conversations we don't have in white groups, and I don't think that white entertainment as a whole has had the chance to see the social experience of what it is to be a person of color and want to expect to play someone like Storm in gaming versus 
Thor in an Avengers game, you know what I'm saying? Or to see colored representation throughout gaming grow and develop. I can't tell you, especially as of late with the PlayStation 5 meeting, how much of a reassurance, and I had maybe a good two to 300 people in a watch party, what joy they got to see black developers on a screen talking about Sony games. So we want to really carry this narrative forward. We want to carry our culture forward and we just want to really bring it to a larger presence to people as a whole to show them this is what it is to be a black gamer. It's a different experience than what you see with white gaming. And it's something that we eventually want to gather data for and um, present to companies as a whole for a greater consideration of us as inclusion. Yeah, I mean, like I said, I have been a gamer all my life since, I don't know, since I was like two. So, you know, this is definitely, that's why I asked you to be on the panel because I was like, you know, I don't know anybody that can speak to that experience better than you can. Um, and because this is a discussion about different types of representation, you know, with the world being so digital, gaming has become the number one platform for expression across all mediums. So it, I was like, it would be remiss for me to just focus purely on like, you know, writing and film when we just miss out on a le legit multi-billion dollar entry that's just sitting on the side over there. Um, so I definitely thought that that was important. Um, and like I said, this really is just a conversation. Um, you know, the next hour or so, um, I have several questions. We may not get to all of them, but um, yeah, I have a number of questions that hit on various parts of each kind of representation that you all represent. Um, and so this is meant to be an open discussion. Um, you know, people can feel free to talk about it. You know, there's no real right or wrong answer. Um, but, you know, I think that the wealth that people will get out of this is just being able to hear about how different mediums handle some of these um, intense kinds of theories. Um, and like I said, the first question for me is really that I just want to jump right into the deep meat, um, which is, so I'm going to read the question online and then um, you guys can feel free to respond. Some of the questions are specific to specific people, but most of them are for all of you. So feel free to respond and, um, you know, I'll try to a lot around 10 to 15 minutes ish per question. So um, this first question is there is a deep kind of resentment growing about the current state of black media and academically, there is a lot of talk about whether or not representation still matters with a lot of people saying that it does, and those who say it does not, claiming that this is a viewpoint that is a crutch in this day and age. So the question that I wanna start with for the panel is, do you think representation is still relevant in 2020? Yes or no, and why or why not? I told you. Start with, I, told you, I was gonna start with the deep me. I'm not wasting no time. We'll just get right in on it. Okay, I'm gonna I'm gonna uh, dial it back historically. Um, so one of the uh, uh, psychological studies examples that we, that um, have been pretty famous um, has been uh, the doll test, um, where you have you know. Uh, a you know a child looking at a a white doll and a black doll and deciding which one is prettier which one is more worthy which one is smarter typically um even when they've most recently done this even the black children have chosen the white doll that is the one that represents what's better that is the one that represents what's intelligent that is the one that represents possibility um whereas the black doll does not um and so from the time that, that, that we are introduced to media, whether it's through books, television shows, um, you know, from the very get-go, if we don't see different types of people excelling, then what we see in a pattern is only one type of person, only one type of skin color, only one type of reputation has the ability to excel. So representation is extremely relevant because you have to be able to see yourself um, in different ways to picture what is what is possible in the future. So you know it's it's interesting that there's kind of this resentment I feel like that's happening because I feel like some people are like, isn't this enough? Isn't this enough? And it's like, no, it's not. Mm -hmm. um, there's a 
there's a series of infographics from, I think it's, uh, it's the Center for uh, where they research children books and, and, the, re and the, um, the amount of representation in children's books, where if you look at the 2012 infographic, 92% of the books that they looked at had white protagonists. If you look at the one, one of the most recent ones back in 2018, that has gone down to like 47%. So I get that people are shocked, like, oh my gosh, all of this has changed. True. It's still the majority because we're taking what was a huge number and then separating it amongst many different groups. And the, play, and the place that got the most increase was like in animals and inanimate objects. Yeah, I heard somebody talk about that the other day. Um, somebody in the Black Sci-Fi group was like, can Black people just be Black people on screen? And they basically pointed out, they were like, there is no Black film in major, like, in major representation that where you're not an animal, like, you know, they, they were like Princess and the Frog, Soul. Um, they just went through, like, all these different variations. And I was just, I, they were like, the spot, what is it? The one with Will Smith. The Spies Between Us, or I can't think of what. Yeah, the, the spy one where it turns into a pigeon. Uh, yeah, and it was just kind of like, I honestly hadn't thought about it until they raised the point. But their question was like, <laughs> even when it's like, yeah, you want to be, you want to be like, yes, pro-Black, yes, representation. But if Black people aren't actually on screen, it's like, okay, so yes, Black pigeons? Like, <laughs> yes, Black frogs? <laughs> yes, Black spirits? But, but I mean, honestly, the only person I could think of was Frozone. Frozone is the only person in an animated movie that I can think of that's actually a full-on whole Black person with his whole Black family. That And that was it. Frozone is the only person I could think of. And I just thought it was just a weird, it's a weird, you know, hill to die on, so to speak, as people say. But it makes sense. Um, and so, Chris, I was going to ask you, like, I know, like, for example, growing up on TV, we had UPN, and, I mean, UPN used to be lit, and um, there was UPN and BET, and I feel like there was one other Black channel. Am I missing it? B BET, I know BET and UPN were, were the ones, um, but yeah, I was just wondering, like, it's like, if you wanted, like, Black content, like, that's where you went. <laughs> And I was just thinking, in terms of, like, Latinx representation, like, what, I mean, I'm just like, Telemundo, Univision, like, what, I mean, it's like, was there, like, an MTV Latino? Like, what, I'm trying to remember. I'm sure there probably it was. an MTV Internacional, and it was Daisy Puentes <laughs> that was the host of that, but it was all Spanish, and it was on Telemundo. Of but, course. you know, but what we have to remember, too, in that specific instances that not all Latinos are very fluent in Spanish. Right. Right. It, it, like Latinx community varies. Not, you know, earlier I was saying, you know, we can look any kind of racial category, but we can also sound different. So I speak English without an accent. And that actually throws people off because they expect me to sound Latinx, right? Which is a whole different conversation. But, um, you know, but, but to get back to the question here, which is, um, is representation relevant? And just building on what Letitia said, yeah, it still matters. Uh, it, 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 is, it, is, it is always going to be an issue so long as what we see on screen doesn't match the percentages of our demographic in this country, right? So, for example, the Latinx demographic comprises almost 20% of all people in the United States. And I guarantee you, all you know, 20% of all characters in, in say visual media are not Latinx, right? So that's, it's, just a, it's just a very simple kind of like balance. But then we can go even deeper and say, you know, um, you know, a white actor can play almost any character and not be relegated to that kind of character, right? So let's say, well, white actors can only play this. But if we have, you know, black women, black men, Latinx men, Latinx women, well, they only play certain characters, right? Or they're um, shackled to certain kinds of stereotypical representation, right? Um, so I guess what I'd like to underscore is that, you know, 
we're now in a position to talk about the nuances of representation, not just can we have more representation. And I think earlier, it may have been Letitia that was talking about uh, like authenticity, right? It's like, you know, you know, the Latinx community is widely varied in its political kind of ideologies and its religious ideologies and its, and its nations of origin is a very diverse group. And yet what we see on television and film generally is Mexican American culture, very specific like slice of that. So even when we're talking about a certain group, we're talking about representation and like true representation would be widely divergent, widely diverse. And we are nowhere near that. So I think those who say, well, maybe we shouldn't be talking about representation, like that's behind us. Those are the same kind of people that say, well, black people already have February. Like they have Black History Month. So like, why are we still talking about this? Right? So it, it's the same kind of like, well, now you've got a little bit. Now quit complaining and let us go back to the way it was. Chimba, I, I'm just curious. What, uh, I mean, I don't recall with any kind of regularity a whole lot of Black anything when I lived <laughs> in the UK. <laughs> So, I mean, I was just trying to feel like, what, what kind of representation do they have of Black people in, in England? Because I truly do not know. I'm going to insert an example from my friend who um, I went to, to school with, sorry, high school with, and he's an actor. And um, so when we were, I think this was about 15 years ago, we were so excited because we were like, he's going to be on TV, so we're all going to tune in and watch it. But I think underneath that is the idea that we knew a he wasn't going to be a central character uh b it was going to be a small role c he might not even have a speaking part and it was like d and the role is going to be something stereotypical and lo and behold we were so proud of him to see him up on screen but he was um, playing the part of uh i think he was the brother of um a victim of uh crime i think it was knife crime and obviously knife crime is something that's very big in, in London. And I think his brother had died and he had like two lines talking about, you know, knives in, in, in London. And that was it. So when you talk about representation, that's the kind of thing that we see. If we're on TV in London, in, in the UK, it's not with any kind of holistic, positive connotations. It's usually centered around something that is negative. Um, even, you know, whether that's done very overtly or whether that's done in a, in a subtle fashion. We don't have people that look like me necessarily leading a show, having their own show, having a firm connection with the network and, and seeing them on daytime TV. We're, we're not necessarily hosts. We might do the news, but it's not news about, um, you know, a diverse culture. It's, it's, it's white news. <laughs> so, you know, you you saw it when you were here we're not anywhere the the people that we do see that look like us are from america so when i was growing up in in this country it was american television that uh, gave me representations of myself and not necessarily uk television and mm. i can name the you know maybe two shows which had predominantly black or diverse cast in this country and we haven't had anything since then to replace them since the 80s. So it doesn't really exist here. We, we get our culture from America. That's where we get our culture. And I think that's why so many British writers, artists, et cetera, go to America and steal your jobs because there is nothing, there is nothing here for us. There is nothing here for us. So we look I to you that's really point. because that's where, the, that's where the, the opportunities are. So if you're saying to me there's a lack of opportunity there, I'm like, oh no no no, you should you should be here because <laughs> it's 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 even it's even worse. We're just seen and not heard. This kind of 1980s, you know, you see kids but you don't hear them. That's what it's like here. You're seen but you're not really heard. And I mean, I, I mean, like I said, I was just as you were talking, I was thinking of John Boyega and mm -hmm. how he has become just the. I mean, it's weird because he's become like the british the black british. the mouthpiece <laughs> yes honestly he, john boyega has become a straight up black british mouthpiece um which i think he's at least right now happy to play the role um and i was so worried when he got in high, up in hyde park 
and was out here <laughs> excoriating racists on Twitter. I was worried for his income because there's not many in, in his position. So I was like, is John going to work again? Is he going to eat? I mean, because, you know, it's just, un it's just like, no. unheard of here. Yeah, it's unheard no, it's of here. Like, I was like, you can't be doing that. You're too new. Like, it's just, absolutely unheard of here. Absolutely like, unheard of. I just, uh, you know, when, when Lucas Arts came out the next day and said, John Boyega, you are our hero, I cried. I'm not going to lie. I cried because to see a film company backing a Black person who was publicly yelling at racists was fabulous. Like, I mean, they didn't have to do that. Lucas Arts did not have to do that. And I feel like most, most companies would be like, the views expressed of this particular person do not represent because like, that's you know am i wrong y'all tell no, me I'm, wrong. no, no, no you're, I'm, you're absolutely right go ahead you know, they play it. that's how they play the card the views expressed of this particular person do not represent x company and you see white racists getting smashed by that every day when they come out the mouth with some foolishness and then their company is like um no <laughs> fired so I was wondering, can this boomerang and can it can it go backwards? And will it end the career of someone who was really promising when he just got started? And I was really happy to say, they say he has more offers. <laughs> more offers than he ever did. And, and, mm -hmm. but, but, like, but here's the thing though, like, and it's one of those weird things about kind of like this moment, because it's like, especially whomever's in, whomever is like in marketing or in PR has done the math and being like, in this moment, we realize that supporting black people is the best thing to do financially. <laughs> we don't want to ruin For our bottom brain. line, send. Right. Uh, but if you look at, you know, Disney and Lucasfilm's behavior toward John Biego during the run of these Star Trek movies and the things that he faced from the fandom and from, you know, just that interaction, they've been very silent about the abuse that he's endured. Right. They, you know, they... they nothing about Rose, wasn't it Rose Tran? Yeah. Um, oh, God, why am I... Uh, Kelly, Kelly, Kelly... Oh, God. Kelly's her actual name. <laughs> I, don't know, I don't know why I jumped to her, her actual movie character, but... Right. But, but so yeah, like, no. Um, but yeah, so like there, there was a lot of a lot of a lot of negative pushback that Disney was very silent on. So yeah. and and even when Star Wars went to um, China, they array not only did they that, yeah. yeah they either minimize John Boyega's picture or like away from the company. Yeah. yeah, and yeah, and so it's like it's interesting to be like, wow, so you guys get to support me when it's convenient for you. Um, so that means that this is not necessarily a um a matter of your own principles, but this is clearly a matter of 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 finance and you and you seeing that your actor has gotten this platform and has gotten ton of support for it. Had he not gotten that support, had this not happened in this moment, right. then they, they would have sent him his papers. But you know, he already he already cashed those Disney checks like <laughs> like it was just kind of like, thank you for the money. Y'all been crappy. I'll see you later. So <laughs> They can't get their money back. <laughs> True. I was, I mean, so yeah, I was gonna say we're, we're coming to time, but I just wanted to, so the general consensus, and I mean, JC, you can add something here on the end, is that y'all are saying that representation is still, in fact, relevant, regardless of, because I swear I read in my class that there are some academics who are just like, you know, what kind of what Chris said, which is that it's the nuance that folks should be, that we should be focusing on now and not, you know, it's not enough to just have a black face on a on a movie, but that the nuance is more important. But I'm still like, to Shim's point, <laughs> but there's just not enough black faces though. Like we can't even get to the level of nuance if there's literally like six black people. The joke that we used to have when I was growing up was name famous the famous black uh, actors, and it was always. I mean, I'm sure all y'all can name the exact same list that I did. Denzel. Will Smith. Uh, I mean, and like these. <laughs> <Not bad. laughs> 
Eddie Murphy. That's it. Yeah, Eddie. Well, I see when I'm growing up, not even Eddie Murphy. Like Eddie Murphy was, he was probably phased out by the time I was growing up. It's so, my generation, my age. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, it's. I mean, these days you got Idris Elba. You got uh, what is that child's name? JC, help me. He was um, Jeep Jacks in Mortal Kombat 11. The guy who. Oh, uh, do uh, he played James on Supergirl? His name. Is- no, um, the younger one from Desperate Housewives and Brother. Dang, that might have been too far back. Um, he played uh, James on Supergirl. Sandra, Sandra Bullock's lover in Bird Box. What's uh, his name? I'm trying to think of it. Oh my God. Paul, his name is James something. Um, oh my goodness. Oh Jesus. I, I can't. But, 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 but yes, I mean, like I said. Makai Brooks. Say what? Makai Brooks. Makai bro, yes, that's what I'm saying. We have a lot more people that are up and coming. You know, Jamie Fox. You know, all these people who were probably not on the radar when I was growing up that are now. And there's a lot of black women too. It's not just Halle Berry taking up every single role across the board. I love yeah. that. We had all questionable roles. <laughs> <laughs> we ain't gonna talk about that. We're not gonna talk about that right now. That's a discussion for another time. The quality is a, is another question, um, but okay, l- let's move on to question number two. Um, Can I go on on question oh, number yeah, one really quick? Of course. Just to give a little bit of relevance, I won't take long, and I do apologize. Um, in gaming, diversity is an even bigger problem because uh, much of the market comes from Japan. So when people say representation doesn't matter, imagine bringing to another nationality a problem that is not their own because they do not suffer from a deep colorist dynamic within right. their social hierarchy um you see maybe um some stories about musashi miyamoto being the darkest um there are some uh subtexts about nobunaga uh, oda being a darkest skin during feudal japan but for the most part most of the people that you see in asia that are of darker skin are in the islands in malaysia and indonesia you don't see them in mainstream japan so we fight in the industry not only abroad in japan to say hey we need diversity but even in the states we have a problem right now where silicon valley only has 2.2 two percent black developers to which one of their white developers just went national because he was doing a racist tirade at a restaurant and he thought he was perfectly within his rights to do so so systemically we have a lot to unpack when it comes to gaming and development and i applaud sony for what they did but i don't want to see it be a tap dance on fad narrative because they're trying to stay within a price point that they want to make for quarterly sales i want to see this go farther i know with my group personally we're trying to look at, you know, becoming an MPO so that we can kind of move forward, get political support, and we can go to Capitol Hill and make a proposal where we can either unionize black developers or that we can create some type of advocated legislation that will allow protections and incentives for companies to out black developers. Because we do have conferences, like I think it's called Nespi, where you have like almost 10,000 developers that come together throughout the year, and you don't have major companies that are actively scouting them, or if they are, they're scouting them to a point where it's kind of like, I kind of make it akin to Naruto with the Uzumakis. You know how they all got split up after the third major war, and every time you saw somebody with red hair, you just knew they were Uzumaki. I feel like Black developers around the world are pretty much the same. When you see one, you just know that they're a Black developer because they're Black, but there's no like well-built profile behind them. Sony kind of just made the first step in 2020. So to say that you know representation does not matter, oh my goodness, do we have a long way to go, especially with nations that are developing top in high quality technology and gaming that we have, you know, in some facets yet to get access to. And we still have to have a conversation with them to even get in the door on their end, let alone in the end of America, to get to a place where we can say, okay, well, now we can calm down and relax. You know, we're like decades away. But continue me on time. No, I mean, and I, like I said, I have a question that will speak to that specifically um, a little later on. So um, yeah, I'm definitely gonna get back to that because I think that's a really, um, that's a really poignant point, point that you made. Um, for, so for question two, it, um, is it even reasonable to believe that white people as the majority or even non-black folk are expected to buy into the call for more Black expression, whether it's Black theater, Black people on TV in various ways, Black movies, or Black video games and characters. Sometimes I think that the discussion seems to be siloed into levels of importance at the moment, i.e. trans, Black, etc. 
And this is one of the problems that I have with disability representation at the moment, because it really is never there. If we're being honest, how do we expect people to increase their share of the buy-in? Um, you know, if we're going to talk about representation and how, how to, <laughs> we can't even have the conversation about how to get better representation if the American public is not willing to buy in. Um, I don't know if, if, if this question makes sense, but my, my question is like, how do we expect people to buy in to our demand <laughs> for better representation? We can sit here and shout from the rooftops all we want. We want black vampires. We want black ma magicians. We want black warlocks. But if white people aren't willing to watch black warlocks and black vampires, it's not going to happen is my question. So like, how do you think that we increase the buy-in of the public? Can I lead in on this? Sure. Um, man, what I'm about to say might hit a little while, but um, there's a silent white community already does. Did anybody, when they saw Black Panther, have a conversation with anybody that, uh, that was white that may have, quote unquote, taken an issue to it? All the time. I mean, all the white people that I knew that saw the movie was like, it was OK. Uh, there, okay. there were a few but they went to go people, see it. People that were like, it was awesome, but most of them were like, it was good. Right. Yeah. Exactly. I, I, I talked to this one woman on the train. She was like, "Me and my husband didn't like it." I was like, "Why? We we just did it." So that right there, I think, is our strongest marketing ploy when it comes to getting those who are white to buy into the black narrative. When we talk about entertainment in the industry and trying to get high subcultures, they didn't like it but they spent their money to go see it. You see what I'm saying? So e even with the romance that they have with, I mean, uh, let's take Fetty Wap, for example. God knows how many people, you know, that were white, I heard bumping Fetty Wap down the street while he was popping with 1738. Why do people buy into this? You know, even in the music industry, they talk about, well, you know, you can sell a record, but if somebody's teenage daughter is going to beg their mother to go buy this album for you or get you to stream, you know, it's a conversation that they have. And oftentimes when we see our culture represented, it's by people, streamers in game, like Ninja. Ninja comes off like a, you know, um, if you could not see him, think he was black the way he has a conversation with people on stream. And it's just like, when you see that, I think people already kind of buy in and secretly just study. I think we're at a point in a community where we just need to stand out and just make this the takeover that it should be and be like, okay, I get you've been kind of appropriating what we do, but now we're here in visibility. So if you could shift your attention this way and then, you know, you can still spend your money the same way you have been quietly. But at this point, you can kind of louder about how you buy into our expression. But I think they already do it. I mean, we didn't get billion dollars by ourselves with Panther. I think we did maybe, you know, a good eight to 90% of it, but I think there was, you know, at least a 10% of the white constituency that was just like, oh man, this thing's so big. Let me just go see what this is all about. And I think white people already have all that curiosity. And when they have their own conversations at their dinner table, that stuff can kind of creep out and influence. And if we're using our direction with black representation to do the same, we're so loud and we support it so much. I think white people won't have a choice but to influence, even with my group with gaming. I can't tell you how many white people I turned down coming to my group every week. They're trying to get in there all the time, but let them in. But they're curious and they want to see it. And I feel like they're just quiet. They don't want to say anything. It's kind of like how they voted in the elections and everything else. They do. They're quiet and they don't want to tell you nothing, but they're doing it. Do y'all agree? Disagree? I think there's something to be said for th for for properties like like um, that do have black representation, but in many ways, or diverse representation, but in many ways have been couched in white narratives. Um, because I feel like those have a tendency to get more, you know, they, they, they're the ones who, who make the million dollars. They're the ones who, you know, get that boost. Um, even when they are so steeped in, in our culture, like there's, a, you know, you know, Hamilton just got on Disney Plus, there's a lot of conversation about it, but one of the big conversations is like, yo, why did Hamilton get so big and in the heist was successful, but it didn't become a culture phenomenon. And one of the, 
one of the reasons that some people are saying is that because you know you do have you do have people of color in the cast and you know it's a huge uh it's a huge um expression of diversity of culture yet it is still representing a fundamental right narrative um you know black panther is you know you know definitely a huge cultural expression however it is still couched within marvel which was you know a fundamentally you know narrative written by white folks and thus you know, and it is supported um, and continues to support a overall white corporate, you know, white corporate agenda. So it's interesting to see what happens when that buy-in, you know, with that buy-in, and even when it is kind of, you know, people of color with white narratives, there are still people who do push back, which I think is kind of fascinating. Um, so do I think it's possible to increase buy-in? Absolutely, but. I also think it's uh, it's kind of a, a tenuous conversation, um, you know. So like, are people going to be buying like the life story of Angela Davis? I don't know. Uh, but you know, when they did, you know, Nina Simone, which was questionable, that also had questionable uh, uh, returns. So you know, I don't know. Did a bu- did a bunch of white folks see Rosewood? I know I did, but. <laughs> I mean, well, let me let me just jump in real quick and say, um, you know, th- there's we're what we're also talking about here is just the quality of storytelling, right? Um, oh, Lord, I don't Lord. care who it is, I don't care what the identity positions are of the people involved or the character. If it's not a compelling story, I'm not interested, right? So at at some base level, we're talking about quality of storytelling. We look at something like Moonlight, Barry Jenkins. Uh, that is not tied to a Marvel property, and it won the Best Picture that year, even though it was for a couple seconds it didn't win, right? But it, but it, it, ah, it yeah, yeah, I forgot about that. And Boy. it's a phenomenal film, <laughs> and it portrays black masculinity in an atypical, unexpected way that we are used to seeing on film. Um, and I think part of the appeal of that film, even though it might be disturbing to say white audiences to even contemplate black masculinity in that way. Um, it's, it's, it's just a very compelling story and it's very well rendered. Um, and so when we're talking about buy-in, I think part of what we're saying is like a, almost a, a, a metaphorical buy-in, but I'm almost talking about a literal buy-in. Like they have to support those stories that are really good examples of storytelling. And, you know, there's there's the there's the you know part of the conversation that well we should just support everything, um, and that's a different conversation that that I don't want to uh, that, that that interests me less. What I'm interested in is 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 quality engaging storytelling um, that isn't giving that is not given its due that is not given its publicity and marketing campaign, which is what often happens. And so sometimes it has to be grassroots, and we say, well, this is a great film, this is a great show this is a great novel, we have to go, we have to go check this out and tell people about it. Um, and I, and I, I think that's where, you know, this kind of metaphorical buy-in comes in across, um, you know, racial identity categories. Um, uh, you know, th- that's, the, that's the thing about Hamilton uh, for, for all of its imperfections, and it does have them. Um, if you just told someone, hey, we're, you know, we're, we're going to make a musical about the life of Alexander Hamilton, it doesn't sound very engaging at all. <laughs> but what what happened is Lynn Manuel Miranda's genius of incorporating very specific and beloved traditions of music uh, and theater into his kind of conception of the immigrant story of which he is. He's often talked about how when he read the biography on Hamilton, it made it reminded him of his own father, right? So he had that personal connection, and it's really an immigrant story. And that's what I think is so fascinating about that story is that it rests you know, this kind of like monolithic white uh, uh, founding father myth that we have in this country, it kind of takes it out of its context and now we see it differently. Um, Those are the kinds of things that I think appeal to like the broader buying public. And so it's it's complex. I didn't give her the answer. I just wanted to give some potential. No, I mean, that that makes total sense. I actually was wondering, I'm like, so are you saying that we all need to, that, that, that black creatives need to go find them a Brad Pitt? Because Brad Pitt has been low-key responsible for every man. Moonlight. Every Moonlight. Man. I was going to yeah. say that. Oh, my goodness. Moonlight. That's exactly like what he decade, did. Yeah. Brad Pitt has been... Silence. Silence. 
Yeah. Well, <laughs> and, and it's, it's that it's that idea of how do you access, you know, the tools, the resources that you need to get the story out. This is this is every filmmaker, every every storyteller out there. How do I get my story out there? Um, you know, and 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 that's the that's another issue that that we're confronted with is when when those gatekeepers and those that are in power have certain expectations for the kind of stories that they are comfortable with, they are not then willing to take a chance on a story that has the kind of story that has not been you know a kind of a mainstream film or something that is worthy of say uh, Academy Award uh, recognition. Uh, so it does take someone who has power, who has clout and says, okay, I'm gonna take a chance on this. And then what happens is it opens doors because the publishing and film industry is very conservative in that it wants to rely on past success for, for, for future investment. So that's why they rely so heavily on stereotypes. Well, that's worked before, let's just replicate it again. Let's just do another one of those and it's gonna be a cash cow. And they, they're less willing to take a chance on something that has no precedent, but may be something that everyone's clamoring for. Right, it's true. Um, yeah, I think that's, that is a really good idea. Uh, let me see here, I'm going to move to the next one. Um, question three. So in the age of Black Lives Matter, I've been jokingly calling them protest bodies or situations that have changed to favor Black people in the wake of George Floyd's death, like the removal of the Aunt Jemima icon off pancake bottles or the painting of Black Lives Matter murals over various street corners of the world. Many of these have included race swaps or introductions to series and shows that have never had Black people in their runs. And a few examples include The Bachelor, the Wonder Years, Batwoman as of yesterday, The Simpsons, Big Mouth, Family Guy, and even Barbie with baby hairs. So my question is, if we're having a conversation about Black creative expression, so like, what is y'all's take on this? Um, do you think it's good? Is it bad? Are you lukewarm? Like, where are you on the question of like race swaps and the introduction of like, cause I, <laughs> Trust and believe, my friend made a really good point yesterday about the Wonder Years, which I have never seen. But my friend Casey was like, the Wonder Years is a story about a, apparently a white family in Alabama ruminating on the 60s, about how good the 60s was. And they were like, that would be vastly different for an all black family. And I'm like, are you really about to go there, ABC? Shashem, but I don't know if you heard this, but the Wonder Years announced yesterday that, that it's going to be revived with an all-Black family. So I'm just like, I, I don't, huh? Was the question that I had. And it was just kind of like, are they really going to do a story about a Black family in the middle of the civil rights movement? Or, or you know, is it really good? Is it going to be like, the, I mean, I, nobody really knows what the story plot is now. But you know, my question is like, in order to make that work, are they literally going to have to shift it in a different direction for the comfort of white audiences? Because they still gotta, people still gotta watch it. So I'm, I'm really skeptical at the moment with these. I love your protest body counts. They're what I live for. Um, when I'm marking, <laughs> when I'm marking all day, I'm like, oh, something else has happened. But you know, do I take it seriously? There's, I'm, I'm, I'm a cynic um, and I'm a cynic because uh, there's a movement going on and money is involved. And a lot of people are jumping on a bandwagon and I can't tell who is genuine and who is not genuine. All I can say is I look for people who are doing things before this movement. So when I look at a company like Ben and Jerry's who are speaking up, in my mind, Ben and Jerry's has been speaking up for a long time. That's yeah, why yeah. I love my Ben and Jerry's. I eat my Ben and Jerry's. I pay attention to what the founders of Ben and Jerry's are saying, because they have been um, allied with a lot of marginalized groups for a very long time. So when Ben and Jerry's speak up in terms of Black Lives Matter, I listen. Um, however, when it came to you, however, that's what I'm saying. When Snapple it, just announced today that they're now getting rid of all racial epithets. And my friend Clayton was like, why wasn't that introduced when Scrabble was introduced? <laughs> like, this is it. Even it with, um, I think even with Nike and um, Colin Kaepernick, I hope, uh, Kaepernick, I hope I'm saying it correctly. Um, when they featured him as the face of Nike, I was still skeptical. 
because I thought, well, you know that there's a lot of people in our culture who buy Nike and wear Nike. And I felt like that was a move to appease us and keep our money still ticking over with Nike. And also, again, jumping on a bandwagon. So for me, there's a lot of tokenism going on. And as you said with your comment about Scrabble, why weren't these things happening before? Um, it's here right now. I'm skeptical about whether these things are going to exist in the future. I'd, I'd, I'd like to give a different take, uh, slightly different, uh, although I agree with a lot of what you just said. Um, when it comes to Co Colin Kaepernick, I mean, Nike did stick with him years ago. Um, they're not on the bandwagon now. They stuck with him when the NFL dropped him, basically uh, blackballed him. So um, I do think that for me, there's just like, just shameless pragmatism. I, I you know, if, um, you know, uh, uh, Coca-Cola, you know, comes out and says, we're no longer going to advertise on social media until they do more about uh, policing how, you know, people, you know, uh, kind of uh, purvey in hatred. Um, I could say, well, where were you before? And that's, and that is a valid criticism. But on the other hand, like, that's moving the needle. That is, that is getting us toward um, a, you know, a better place, a place where we're kind of want to see. So maybe I'm less cynical, <laughs> right? And, and just a little more pragmatic and say, by any means necessary, I will take, you know, someone or, or a corporation that didn't give a damn before, but now is going to put up millions and multi-millions of dollars right now. It is for their own uh, PR benefit, but I'll take it, right? I mean, that's just, it's just kind of my, um, you know, kind of take on that. And then if I could just come back to the wonder years, uh, I'm, kind of, I'm kind of similar there too. Like the, the, the move to reimagine the wonder years has to completely change the nostalgia of the original show, like the RC said, but I also feel like it kind of does a similar move or could potentially do a similar move to like what Hamilton did, right? Like I had always conceived of Alexander Hamilton as a white guy who was shot by the vice president and was, was killed in a duel. Like that, that, was, that was really all I knew about him uh, from my teachings in you know, high school or, or junior high or whatever. And so to, to have it recast as an immigrant story, which is, you know, it, you know it, yeah, it is, but you, know, you, you, could, you could be critical of that. But, but to reimagine what that history looks like if it were black and brown people, um, you know, really confronts the, the, the erasure and the, invi and the made invisibility of those people. And it, we have to confront it when we see that show. And, and I think something like the Wonder Years um, reboot would, could potentially do something like that. And, and it, that, that, that happened with uh, um, One Day at a Time, right? So now it is a Latinx family. And, <laughs> and I think the show does a really good job. Um, so, um, you, know, I, you know, and, and then, but then that also opens up opportunities for original storytelling, right? To say, hey, look, this was within the context of black culture or Latinx culture, and it was a huge hit. Now, studios and streaming platforms are, are much more likely to green light other projects based on that, ex on, on, on that success. I was thinking about, no, the, you, you said one day at a time. I was thinking of Party of Five. They mm, redid, yeah. Freeform redid Party of Five as a Latinx story about immigration policy. Yeah, um, I think the father gets deported. Something like that. I just, I, I remember I saw the trailer and I was thinking, that was not what Party of Five was about. Like, I was like, wait a minute, Nev Campbell. <laughs> like, like, what else? I never saw Party of Five, yeah, but I remember so growing up and I was like, it didn't have nothing to do with immigration policy. So like, what? huh? Um, well, I mean, like, well, what they did with that one is the idea, because in the original Party of Five, it was like their parents had died in a car crash. Um, and so they were like, what is another way that like kind of the parents can be removed and then you were kind of stuck with these like set of siblings have to deal with it. So as a concept, I thought it was, I thought it was actually pretty interesting and interesting update. And it's funny that you mentioned that that got canceled because one day at a time also was like canceled and revived and canceled and revived. <laughs> like it's been a right. mess. And to go back to what we were talking about, kind of like publishing and, and marketing, uh, one of the creators just just on Twitter, she was like, look, they don't talk to us 
and they stop us from getting in front of people and that's what caused this like we're here we're not we're here we're not um even when we've had support within our community who said like this is excellent um so like that's just been kind of an interesting story i don't know if party of five got really a following i know i watched a couple episodes and thought it was interesting um like the new reboot um but to go back um to go back what you said about the um kind of suspicion around kind of these you know swaps and everything it's what I think I find interesting, especially when you have companies who are coming out with these statements, because I do have my own suspicions, but I also feel like, hey, you said this thing. Now I hold you to it. Right. You know, you made this, you made this statement public. Now I'm going to make sure it sticks. Because right. I don't trust you to make sure it sticks by yourself. So I will do everything in my power to keep you to your word. So like that's how I Aunt feel. Jemima icon, like the next Aunt Jemima icon, you know, it's like y'all need to be looking at, you know, RuPaul or something. Like, they're like, <laughs> we're going to make sure that the next person you put on that pancake bottle <laughs> don't look nothing close to nobody's mammy. But also, you need to know why that's a problem. Because I see right. a lot of people who are pulling things and it's like, yeah, I heard this is a problem. So we're pulling. I'm like, but do you know why and thus <laughs> right. how to replace it? Or right. are you just being like, Oh, 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 that's a thing that someone told me about two weeks ago. So I guess I'll just change it. So that's actually what happened to Lady Antebellum. Uh, <laughs> for, <laughs> for those of you who don't know, Lady Antebellum changed her name to Lady A in, in, as a protest body. But then yesterday it was reported that now they're suing the actual Lady A, who is a Black woman and a jazz singer who has had that name for years. And they were just like, wait a minute, Lady Isabella, did you say you was doing this in support of Black people? And now there's a Black person that is in your, in your way and you want to sue her for the next. You didn't learn anything. So basically, this just tells me that you had the wrong idea for what you were doing initially and you also didn't hire a publicist to check out that name before you took it. <laughs> I mean, am I wrong or not? Like, I, I agree with you, Leticia. I think that that is going to be critical. People keep asking, like, are these changes permanent? Are they real? Are they going to last? We don't really know the answer to that, but I think your point is an excellent one in that now that they have made the statement out loud, we get to hold them to it. <laughs> because you said Black Lives Matter, Sony, I'm now fully expecting to see more Black people in all of your games, more Black developers on all of your sites. Like, I expect you to do it. And trust and believe, if we come to this again, I mean, in like two years and nothing has changed, yeah, we gon' like, we'll, we'll, just, we'll just take the torches and move in in a different direction. <laughs> I mean, like I said, tell me if I'm wrong. Um, did, did you have something that you wanted to add, JC? I'm curious about this because when I see this conversation, the first thing my mind goes to is the evolution of our nominative of that's when it's culture. Uh, we went from being people of color to black to Negro to black to people of color to today. I mean, we got two or three different. I think the most relevant one that I've seen was in the Latinx community, um, went Latino to Afro Latino. I wonder to myself if in 20 years we're going to be having a different conversation about this because there's going to be a different set of schools of thought that are in the atmosphere. I like what's going on right now. I really think that we need to take the face value to do some background infiltration when it comes to inclusion. But I just worry in a couple of decades is another generation going to come right behind us and they just look at this as just pandering as you know some of us kind of think right now and say oh well i don't know if companies did that back to mammy oh no that get a totally different conversation and it, it just makes me nervous about where this goes um can you guys hear me it's going in and out a little bit but yeah Sorry, let me kind of adjust here. Is that better? Yeah. 
Okay. So the whole thing that bothers me about this conversation, just in short, is just, this is, I feel like personally, this is good right now, but that's because it's the age that we're living in. But in 20 years, does this become bad? Kind of like when, and I know this probably seems controversial, but Joe Biden and crime, there was a different climate going on back then with gang violence in the street. Movies. And I know growing up, my mother was the one saying, can y'all get this crime off the streets? Because we live in Columbia, Baltimore City's up the street, and I don't want gangs coming down here shooting my baby while he's outside riding a bike. Today, we look at that as, oh, you tried to trick Blacks into mass incarceration. So it's like, whatever the popular narrative is that time, whoever is there and whatever they did 20 years back, it could become activism to persecution. So I kind of just worry in that facet when it comes to Black advancement in, you know, entertainment, media, and reform, when it all comes together, exactly just what is the magic trick where 20 years later we're not saying, oh, well, that was crazy, you know what I mean? So, I mean, but for the most part, it feels like on the face, you know, seeing everything changed around and being reconsidered. I mean, even if it is for money, there's a reconsideration happening, you know what I'm saying? And there's a lot of marginalized communities, the Washington Redskins and the Native American community that are now kind of getting some things pushed through that they've been talking about. And I think it's kind of, it would be stupid of us not to take advantage of this moment and not to milk it for everything it's worth because we not know what the future holds. And we don't know if in 20 years, we'll even this opportunity again. Something really crazy could happen with the supremacy around here. We have 167 judges that got appointed in this country by, you know, a person that, you know, anything about us like that, you know? So, I mean, we got to think on game here with this. So yeah, that's my opinion on that. Yeah. You're totally right. And I think that's a really good point uh, to think about like what will happen. You know, it's like what's happening now. Will it come back and boomerang us in a bad way? Um, so in the question four, in the last, in the vein of the last question. So how do we avoid tropes of, well, now there's black people here, so you're good. Um, how do we hold consumers and creators uh, and the medium accountable? And I mean, y'all have kind of been talking about this, but I was just curious because, um, you know, one of the things that I, quite frankly, don't want to hear from white people is, okay, well, like, you have all of the things that you asked for, so, so can we get back to our version of the real world now? Like, can we go back to, like, our, ver can we have our charmed back? Like, without your, <laughs> like, <laughs> like, Latinx women, and can we have our Saved by the Bell without your trans lead? Like, can we get our version of X back? Because y'all now have all these other things that you can look at, and I, I worry that that is going to, <laughs> be a comment that is going to be made by somebody of power in the FCC in like 15 years. They're gonna say, you know, with this explosion, of, look, I've already been hearing rumblings about it in relation to women and the superhero genre, uh, because there are, you know, Captain Marvel did really well. So did, uh, uh, what is that movie? Wonder Woman. Uh, you know, black. That's the only reason Black uh, Black Widow got greenlit <laughs> is because of Captain Marvel. It is the reason that there is a Black Widow movie, and so they've been trying to do it forever. But yeah, nobody was on board until they wanted to test screen test Captain Marvel. So you know, I'm just wondering how do we avoid this question or commentary that's coming of Okay, you're good now, so can you shut up? Well, DRC, it, it it's really about not relenting on the pressure because it's going to happen it's it's already starting to happen this is exactly what white fragility teaches us is that when white people and white culture are confronted with uh you know a systemic racist you know history and you know past present and potential future when when they are confronted with a destabilization of that their their instinct is to react negatively, to, um, to get angry, and to proclaim that, you know, we're going down a wrong path and we need to return to normal. Well, the normal is a white supremacist system. So, um, you know, in short, um, we have to keep the pressure up and say, no, it is, it is not enough, right? Because that's, that's exactly what I've been hearing uh, at my university 
where some students are telling some of our students of color, some of our black students, the kinds of things that I said before. Well, you've already got Black History Month. What more do you want? Like those kinds of things are being said right now. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, you had this film, you had Black Panther. Why, are, why do you want more? Um, so yeah, so we, we just have, we have to continue the conversation. We have to continue the pressure. We have to continue to exalt those stories, those storytellers, those artists that are doing the kind of work that we're wanting to see and to support them wherever we can and, and to, and to make noise. Oh, that is totally good. I'm actually gonna, I'm gonna move a little faster so that way I, I, we can get through our questions, but that's a really, that's a really good point. Um, so this one is for JC and Letitia uh, specifically. So are there things about the genre of black theater and screen as well as video games that you consider faux pas? Uh, like if you could, if you could just think of three or maybe not three, I don't know, maybe you don't have any, <laughs> in which case that would be really good. But I'm just curious, are there things about the genre and the way that they portray black people or you know, black stories and black expressions that you consider to be faux pas. Like, if I could give one example, so one of mine, one of my annoyances, like Moonlight. Moonlight is is amazing and it was really great, um, but I'm annoyed. <laughs> I'm annoyed that a story that won Best Picture and that has done so much for black media is still couched in the hood, drugs. And 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 like <laughs> depravity. <laughs> like, I hate the fact that like Chiron is a black drug dealer. That the story is based on. I mean, but I guess the question is like, that's real people. It's real life. It's somebody's real story. So you don't want to discount it. But I hate that. That's the story that got the that won the gold star. That it's the commentary that my mom makes about uh, Training Day. She hates the fact that Denzel Washington's filmography is two miles long. <laughs> He has so many film roles that are excellent. He is an amazing actor in so many different directions. But the one film that you give him an Oscar for is the first time he played a villain. And my mother was like, he's a straight up nigga, is what my mother said. And she never uses that word. And she was like, that is the way that he was portrayed in the film. And you gave him an Oscar for it. <laughs> it's the same thing that happened to Halle Berry. She was famous for not, for not taking off her clothes famous for being one of the only black women in the industry who would flat out refuse to get naked on camera. Then what did she do? <laughs> what did she do? My mother was like, really, the one time, the one time that you chose to do this for a movie that was really indie and didn't give you no kind of paycheck. It was like a low key indie film, but <laughs> white audiences loved it oh so much. And they gave you an Academy Award for it. So to me, those are faux pas. Those are things that like black, that they, the, it's representation that they have done to black people that are not necessary. It is things that they have done that are being lauded that don't do much to help the situation, even while we're trying to support the message. You know, I love the fact that Hallie and Denzel have Oscars. I'm very proud of them. I'm very happy. Both of their Oscars are sitting in the Smithsonian, <laughs> in the black Smithsonian in a case forever. So they gave their Oscars to the Smithsonian Museum forever. But, and I'm glad that they have them, but, but the way you won them though, like, yeah. So the, the, like, that's the question I have. I feel like this actually goes back to question four um, in a way, because um, some of, the, some of the, the faux pas and the problematic aspects of it come from the fact that, um, the the industry um the industry as far as the people who are the power players the you know executives the presidents the vps or whatever are still mostly white um you know there was like just a kind of a, a class uh like class of 2020 um look at all the different studios and who are the people in power and who are the people in charge and it's like pouring milk it's just all white um and so you end up with this power structure which requires things in order for black folks to be seen 
So you have this, you know, kind of expectation of what I feel like they think, you know, Black people are supposed to be, what they're supposed to act like. And then when you play into that, then you get rewarded. So, you know, same thing that happened, you know, with that, that also happened with Green Book, you know, and, and, and the help. Like you have these, you know, narratives that put Black people in front, that feed into the narrative of how they want Black people to be in their world, and thus they get rewarded. However, you since you have real Black people in these roles, they take that reward and say, okay, now I whack you over the head with it, because now I have some clout to do what I want to do. It's this, it's this interesting dichotomy. Um, and so when it comes to, like, faux pas of what you know, what, you know, Black folks are doing or, you know, or in genre, it's, it's a, it's an interesting, complicated question. Um, it's funny when you uh, kind of mentioned Charmed really quickly, uh, there was some, and I do like the show, but there was some, some like language in it where I was like, a Black person didn't write that and it came out of a Black person's mouth and I can tell. Like something about the way you're portraying my culture, something about the way you're portraying the, the linguistic, something is off and I can hear it. Well, I and, just think, I mean, to Chris's point, I think that I feel like with those, with those like Netflix shows, if they say bruja, they're like, oh, we're Latinx. Like because, <laughs> because they, because they picked a word in Spanish that means witch. And so suddenly they're just like, we have the cultural cachet to do this. And I'm just like, do you? D do you? <laughs> do you though? Really, Netflix? Are you sure? Because I'm not. Just because you have, what was the name? Of, there was a show on Netflix that was about a black witch. Yeah, Siempre Bruja, which yeah, a lot of people had a lot of issues with because you're like, wait, you're going to have this black witch with all this power and her goal is to get back to her white colonist boyfriend? Yes, yes. People, people <laughs> had problems. People had problems. <laughs> but I know folks were super excited about it. Like before it came out, the expectation was sky high. And all I heard was like, I'm waiting. I'm here for it. I'm here for it. And then it came out. The folks was just like, what? Yeah. And then if you want to, like I said, talk about, I, I'll go back to Charmed, because you do have these three actresses, of those three actresses, only one is actually Latinx. Only really? one. Yes. Oh, I didn't know that at all. Melanie, uh, Ma uh, Madeline Montauk is, uh, she, she's mixed. Her, her father is Jamaican and her mother is white. And then uh, Sarah Jeffrey, she's also mixed as well. Um, Melanie Diaz is the only one who is actually Puerto Rican. Mm -hmm. And they try to kind of like, well, I think they're light dark enough that they'll pass or whatever. I don't know. <laughs> That's that issue I had mentioned before about not being able to discern who is Latinx just by looking at them. Right. But the conception of if you're just dark skinned, I don't care what your ancestry is. If you're just dark skinned, you could maybe pass for a little Phoenix. They so see that's a faux pas. Don't do that again. Yeah. <laughs> Agreed, for sure. JC, I mean, like I said, I know video games have tons of them. So I was like, I know you got at least one. Um, I do. I have two. My third one goes to writing. It probably shouldn't, but it does. <laughs> um, I hate that Issa and Kenya Barris are getting stuck in this trope bubble. Um, after I saw Black AF on Netflix, I was just like, who's influencing that circle? Because this is like a rated R Blackish, And I'm pretty sure this isn't what Kenya really wanted to put forward, but he just did the best he could with the arena that he was in control of. Um, with Issa, I can't tell you how many conversations we had of her going the way of the game with the pregnancy from, um, I forget her name, the girl that, uh, Lawrence was with, um, anyway, her, her name slips my mind right now, but the trope of running back into those narratives, I feel like the, the two of them as writers just do such an amazing job talking about issues that we don't really get to go around, especially with Issa and the best friend situation this season. I thought that was just brilliant. And then she even talked about imposter syndrome um, during the wind down of her episodes, trying to put forth that party. 
Um, it's just like she does a, but I just hate when they bring the general narrative back around to, oh my God, she's pregnant or, oh my, I just feel like creatively we have more and I, I want studios to just stop strangling our writers into these bubbles. Cause it just, when I see that, I already know what's up and it just be crazy. My second faux pas is, um, dark skin, pink lip characters in gaming and anime. Please stop doing that. Lord Jesus Christ. Oh Mr. My. Popo, Jinx. I can't do it anymore. Um, I just actually, I got into it on Discord because somebody had like a Jinx Mr. Mind. You know that Pokemon generator where you put the two Pokemon together? Um, somebody this morning had that in their Discord and I, I just asked him flat out. I was like, are you black? And he's like, no, what are you talking about? And I was like, have you seen your default picture? And so he's just like, why is there something wrong with it? And I'm like, read the room. You know what I'm saying? And it's just like, I had to just leave the chat because I was... In 2020, we're still looking at these things, and I just blame representation in a lot of media for that, um, which goes into my third trope. I love what Final Fantasy VII Remake did with Barrett, Lord, but I don't love it at the same time. I don't love the boisterous, loud, angry, black cussing man. And it goes to Latisha's point, you can just tell somebody black didn't write that. You know, um, I also just want to I just want to add for people that are unfamiliar with it. Uh, when Final Fantasy VII came out in 1997, there's a character that I think at the time he was the only, or maybe the only red person that you could see who was a person of color in a vid in the game in the video game. He and his character exclusively was the one that was using uh, cuss words. They would they would do asterisks and all kinds of crazy symbols because he was. Cussing, and he had the earring, and he had a he has a he has a machine gun for a he had the fade. Yeah, he had braids and a fade, and this was in 1997, and it was terrible. Like, because nobody else in the game talked like that. I mean, it, literally, they didn't have speech; they just had the speech bubbles. But Barrett's character exclusively was still cussing <laughs> in the speech bubble, and it was. And, I, and then the remake came out, I, and I was like, finally, there's going to be a yeah. No better, you're gonna fix it, and they didn't. And it's like it goes back to my earlier point where I was saying, you know, Japan, we got a long way to go with the conversation, but it's still, if you went out of your way, you know, we're we're talking about a company that, uh, in uh, 2015, I mean, they hired um, old girls from Game of Thrones and uh, Aaron Paul to play in Kingsglaive, and you spent, you know, upwards of a good almost 500 million on this game and you made it all back in the day in sales. So, you know, if you get it to make that type of profit, then where is your effort when it goes into the proper and correct representation? I would expect this out of Lightning and Final Fantasy XIII because you had a big conversation about why they're not female protagonists. But we're talking about a black character who's been iconic in this game, you know, not only as a single father, but a single foster parent, you know what I mean? in the game and he's also disabled you know what i mean because uh you know machine gun on the arm it's like this character is pivotal and, and i just i hate when i see characters like this with the opportunity to get back on the main stage we as a community of fans have yearned for this moment and then the nail kind of just misses the right part of the wall so it's just like a thing for me where and i'm stuck with it you know what i mean because it's here now like what am i going to do and there's nobody i can really talk to because they have project plans and development some little guy out here with a facebook group saying oh my god why they do that you know what i mean so it's like where where it comes to prominence that's just something that i hope that companies just get better because i just hate we're more than the loud black cussing man. Uh, we have so much more to contribute. I mean, it, even in anime with Iron Blooded Orphans, it's just like every single time. You know what I'm saying? And it's just like I just want to see us get to a place where we we we're the president of our corp, and we're the ones that are taking over a company to take it in a new direction, so to speak. I, I want to see us get to that place in gaming and development. I think Mass Effect gets it. Um, I think in certain facets, some fighters get it. I know to get Strife as a character coming out that just looks absolutely amazing. Um, and I can't wait to learn more about him when they do his character reveal. And I really feel like oh, some anime. Say, yeah. I have a question. There's a question for that. Like, like what is, what is done right? I okay, I'll stop. I'll stop. I'm good. Continue. <laughs> so, okay. Actually, question six is for Shimba and Chris. Um, and it spoke to something which we were talking about earlier, Shim. Um, there was a recent discussion across Twitter and the internet called hashtag publishing paid me, which talked about being black in the publishing world and the book industry. I don't know if, if y'all happen to see it because there was a whole lot of tweets. 
Most, if not all of the stories were unflattering and they were exposed to showcase the extreme inequality that is prevalent in a business that people assume is equal in terms of exposure, skill, and fan base. It's not. So why do you think that the publishing houses are able to get away so brazenly with disrespecting people of color? Also, do they have a point with a supposed lack of readership? I think that, um, sorry, that was a deep <laughs> sigh. <laughs> the sigh said um, <laughs> Yeah, I think that uh, they get away with it in publishing because, well, I can only talk from my experience in education and that's because in education, it's not very diverse. So it, it starts early. When I look at the youngest kids that I teach and what they're reading, it starts early and they feed that and they feed that and they feed that and that and that becomes what it is. Um, and even now, I mean, in England, we had uh, our curriculum changed, um, I think five, six years ago. And they said uh, the, the current government then and the man is still in, in, in government, but in a different position. Our education uh, minister said, you know, we want to have a return to the canon, to English literature. So it got even more stifled and we had um you know the return of more dickens they wanted more dickens um you know more shakespeare and even things like of mice and men was kicked off the curriculum and out of the exam um and it happens there and that's the experience of my students that's what they're getting every single day they're not getting that diversity so when i look at publishing i'm not surprised i'm not surprised when I see reading lists at university, I'm, I'm not surprised because it starts so early on. When I look at the, the books that we have in primary school, they're not diverse. Um, this idea of um, you having equal skill level and getting published, I think, is a fallacy. There are gatekeepers in publishing and those gatekeepers publish um, their tastes and those, those tastes are narrow. So it's, it's, sorry, I had a big sigh and I had a big kind of, oh, but I didn't realize people assumed that it was equal. I mean, that's not, I, I didn't realize that people thought it was equal because it's not, and I don't think it ever has been. And I think there is a direct link to education, what's happening in education. I, I feel lucky that I've seen it from those two perspectives, but you know, for me, you have gatekeepers, you have gatekeepers in every single industry and those gatekeepers are similar to the gatekeepers of education. And that cycle goes around again and again and again and again. And we're not getting anything, we're not getting anything new. I never saw manuscripts that were diverse on the deaths of editors. I just didn't see that. That wasn't part of the cycle. The, the, there was a cycle that existed and that was the wheel that kept turning and keeps turning. Um, and, you know, I remember one author saying to me, he was a successful um, black author. He wrote um, books for teenagers. And um, we were at an event and he said to me, oh, I'm, I'm writing a sci-fi book. And I said, God, that's fantastic. You know, when, it, when is that coming out? And I knew his editor. I thought, you know, nice man, I knew his editor. And he said, oh, no, no, it's not coming out because my editor said it won't sell that I need to keep talking about these teenagers in, in, in London, you know, in gangs, et cetera, et cetera. So, you know, I'm not gonna, I'm not gonna put that out because I'm not gonna get the kind of um, backing that I would get, you know, which I have right now with the kind of work that I do. So I don't know if I'm going around in circles, I'm just astonished that people think that this is, a, this is an equal industry because it's not, and it never has been. And I think there's a direct cor correlation with, with education and what we do in education and, and what we turn our kids, kids onto. And the funny thing is, you know, in school, high school right now where I teach, I teach predominantly white kids and they are turned off by the curriculum right now. And this, this curriculum reflects them. You know, I'm standing there, we're looking at your, your Hamlet, we're looking at your Othello, we're looking at King Lear, and the only time they're interested in what I'm saying is if I'm saying, Joshua, you know, you had this experience, tell, tell us about that, how can we map that experience onto what we're seeing here? And Joshua perks up because he seems himself reflected in what I'm saying. So, right. I, I, I'm astonished. <laughs> I'm astonished that people think that it's, a, it's an equal playing field because it's not. You know, this, this curriculum is built for the kids that I'm teaching and they're completely turned off by it. 
So if hmm. they're turned off by it, imagine what it's like for people who are not in the curriculum. Right. And who don't see themselves in it. Chris, you do a lot of publishing as well. So I figured like this would be a question for you. Yeah. Um, well, first of all, I agree uh, that it's astonishing that anyone would think this is an equal kind of thing. And the way you know it is if you go into a bookstore when we could um, try to find works by Latinx authors, you'll often be shunted to a small bookshelf in the back that says Latino stories or something, Hispanic stories. Or um, if, if you're looking for, uh, you know, you know, books on LGBTQ uh, themes, you're going to be shunted to a very small specific um, shelf where you will find those books. Uh, that that tells you that that there are glaring omissions in in the books that are published. So um, otherwise, they would you know all of the books would just be kind of like alphabetical or whatever, um, which is what we see with white authors. They're they they tend to just be all over the place in uh, in all of the shelves basically, um, and so it is not equal. Uh, the other way you know it too is when you query. Uh, an agent or, uh, or a publishing house, they will often say, before you query us, um, take a look at our books and see what we publish. Well, if you're writing of a very particular theme or experience that is not quote unquote mainstream or, or that the mainstream has not taken up, you're out of luck, right? So like that happens, that, that, that is a personal experience that, that I am currently undergoing, which um, I have a memoir that I have out there. And because I am not a recently arrived immigrant from uh, South America, or my parents are not, or my grandparents are not, like we have been here for many generations. And uh, it's a different kind of Latinx experience. When I query, uh, the, 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 the agents are usually very interested. And then when I, when I submit, uh, they tend to say, well, this is, this is really good writing, but it's just like, we can't market this. And what they're saying is there is no market for a Latinx story that doesn't involve drug use or illegal crossing of the border or deportation. Like we're not interested in that right now. So things are not equal. Um, and it's unfortunately earlier I said that, you know, we have to support really good storytelling. Sometimes that good storytelling doesn't even make it out there. Mm. So um, to the other point that you, that, that, that your question raises the RC is, um, why do they get away with this? Well, they get away with this because they make, that's how they make money. They, they, they have made money and they um, have based much of their industry on, on, the, on the principle that non-whites don't read and they don't buy books, right? So um, that's why, and I think Darcy, you've heard me present on this earlier this year, there was a book that is still, if it's not ranked number one New York Times bestseller in fiction, it's, it's in the top five. It's called American Dirt by um, uh, Janine Cummins, uh, who's a, who is a white passing woman. Um, right. she, her, her grandmother was half Puerto Rican, I think, but she grew up as white. And she writes this terrible novel about um, a Mexican mother and her son having to cross into the United States. And it's just loaded with with the with the most execrable um, stereotypes that you could imagine, and yet Oprah Winfrey chose this as her book selection. And as soon as she did that, it, it was a guaranteed bestseller. And she caught flack for it, um, the which is a rare thing. She caught flack for it. Uh, she had to have a series of like mea culpa videos that she did, um, you know, and, and and she had to have these little almost like town halls with the author and critics to talk about this. But, but at the heart of it was the idea that there are many Latinx writers here who, who, are, who are writing all kinds of wonderful stories. And yet what got the, me the mega support of the PR marketing engine of Oprah Winfrey's club is this book that is, a, is it's just the worst kind of book. And it's not even great writing. It's not even really good storytelling. <laughs> and so that, that like, will that change the needle? Well, that was right before COVID-19 hit and no one's talking about it anymore. So while that should have been a conversation we kept having, we are no longer having it because there are, there are uh, uh, what seem to be more important pressing concerns. But the short answer is the publishing industry does not get punished for it. 
and, and, and they will continue to do what they've done because they, they will, I've said this before, they rely on their past successes to green light the projects that go forward. And so anything that doesn't fit their mold uh, isn't seen as a viable option. That's why we see really interesting storytelling come from small presses, independent publishing uh, opportunities and venues. And that goes with comics too. Um, let's, let us not forget that we're, we're here kind of talking about comics as well. Some of the really great uh, um, uh, storytelling uh, in comics form that we're seeing that's from a diverse perspective are coming from the independent publishers, not coming from mainstream. So, um, you know, that's, that's unfortunately, or, you know, good or bad, that's what we have to keep doing. We have to keep supporting those small presses. Uh, and, 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 and what ends up happening is those small presses have uh, success, and then one of the the big five publishers will come by and say, "We will publish it now. We will take it, right?" Um, which is which is which is what happens a lot. Um, so, still a lot of work to do for sure. Yeah, I was gonna say. Um, I mean, I think that that's <laughs> that's a really that's a sad point, but it's a good point. And actually, you raised up a point. I only have a couple of more questions, but one of them, I think, I hope is this one's coming up. Um, so yeah, this one is for me. Um, I, and it's a question to you guys. Basically, I said, folks love talking about race in all the various mediums that y'all are representing today, except when it deals with ex specific issues regarding disability. I jokingly see it as though people act as though they got a cross burn into their flesh whenever issues of disabilities are directly broached and people get squeamish and uncomfortable or they deflect and miss the point altogether. Uh, I have my own thoughts about why this is, but I would love to get y'all's thoughts as to why you think disability doesn't seem to have crossed the barrier when it comes to Black characterizations. And so you could speak about this in relation to books, in relation to uh, theater or screen or video games, like any of any of the mediums. But this one was specific to me, and I was just curious as to what y'all's thoughts were on this. I have a very specific thoughts about it in relation to, to video games, but I'm going to save my commentary. Thoughts? If any? Okay, I will say this. When it comes to representation of people with disabilities in general, across the board, it typically sucks. It, it just does, because you end up with characters who are often solely defined by their disability or it's ignored or we're like, oh my god, they rose above, not like, I'm a person, it's a part of my life, why are you, like, you, you, are, you are stupid, just let me, let me be me. Right. Um, so in general, it's bad, uh, in my opinion. And then I feel like when you you know, have someone who, you know, is of a different, you know, marginalized uh, identity, whether it's, you know, Black or being a woman or whatever. Um, I feel like you get the audience themselves also like, wait, you added this on top of all that? Really? They're like, they already think we're, we're, we're less than this. They already think with this, we're already think this. And you did that? Really, radio? Really? <laughs> You know, so I feel like there, I feel like there's, I, I feel like there is a, uh, an issue with showing people with disabilities in their full personhood. And I think in many ways that's exacerbated when you are, when you're also talking about, you know, whichever diversity that you're talking about. It kind of reminds me of, um, uh, Lena, uh, Lena Waite scene in um, Master of None, where she's talking to her mom, and she's like, you know, mom, I'm, I'm a lesbian, this is life. And her mom's reaction is, you're black and a woman, and you're gonna put this on top of that? That's what, that's what my, my mother said to me. Like, after I, you know, when I, when I, after I came out to my parents, and they were just like, don't you already have enough on your plate, is what she literally said to me. And so I'm just like, you think I didn't already know? Like, you think I already know that? Like, I mean, yeah, but that doesn't mean, I mean... Right, that doesn't stop that from happening, but also... I'm saying, like, it's Thanksgiving. I'm going to get the cranberry sauce. Like, it was gonna happen anyway. Like, <laughs> but it's like, it's like, if, that, if that's the reaction in within our community and amongst our elders, then I feel like there's kind of a larger 
reaction that happens also within the community as a whole. So. But, but also think of what we're talking about. We're, we are asking for the dignity of storytellers to treat people as fully realized humans. And when we have um, an industry that really um, isn't interested in those diverse representations and really only takes the most narrow, like narrowly conceived version of say black identity, black men, black women, Latinx men, like there's no room for intersectionality because it will require that you actually learn and take the time to see these, these particular groups of people as fully realized complex humans. And that, that doesn't happen. So, uh, so unfortunately, I think um, what, we're happen what we're seeing is there's almost only enough room for like certain like black male characters, you know, black female characters, black Latinx uh, or, or, or Afro Latinx, right? And it's like, now we're trying to kind of complicate those identities like they don't even know what to do with us as a kind of a mainstream marginalized identity, much less an intersectional one. And that's what's, that's what's really disappointing and frustrating. I see the frustration and I identify uh, it, you know, and, and I just roll my eyes when I see it because it's clearly, I think it's something that Letitia had mentioned before, like, you know, this, this didn't come from someone who understands that identity position. Right, whether it's a, a, you know whatever that identity position may be, it's someone who has a, a very limited, kind of stereotypical idea of what uh, this particular disability might look like, if they even acknowledge it at all. So what you're saying is, I should just tell people I'm black, and, and give no other further explanation of any kind. <laughs> no, no, quite Man, the opposite. No, just be like, I mean, I'm not giving them. no kind of explanation. We need to challenge them because this, yeah, be, because for. we're. <laughs> where, 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 and, and I'm guilty of it. I'm, I'm sure maybe others are, you know, could confess, confess to doing that. Sometimes, like my background and my like identity, is 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 so atypical, and it, it, it's so complicated to even explain that I just like ignore it and just give people the simplest version of who I am because to tell them like, oh, this is my family, this is how I was raised, it would just it would require like an hour of conversation, and sometimes I don't even have it. So it, it's, it's unfortunate, like, we then have to do the work of teaching people, right, which is what makes it exhausting. Um, I actually, um, I think this is the next question in relation to what you were saying. Uh, okay, yeah. So yeah, uh, this one and the next question are probably my, my favorite. The next question is, is definitely a, a mess. But um, so can any of you think of any good or bad examples of representation and what people should avoid or emulate? I know for me, if I had to just pick just one thing that I saw from the last 12 months, Watchmen. Oh my God, Watchmen. <laughs> Watchmen is the gold star. And I am, I'm still shocked. It's been a year and I'm still shocked that Damon Lindoff had the nerve, like that he had, just had the full on audacity to take a beloved property that didn't have nothing to do with black people and just made it blackity black 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 for no reason whatsoever and like that show i mean did nobody know what to expect and it literally went so left field the people are still scratching their heads trying to figure out why he even decided to do all of that and i i mean i'm just i just honestly when it was over all i could do was applaud <laughs> uh regina king and y'all, look, y what is that man's name? Yaha, Yahad, what? Dr. Manhattan, the new A-lister that's gonna be on everybody's lips because he's the star of Matrix 4. Uh, what is that man's name? Yaha, Yaha Abdul Mateen. Um, Lord Jesus, he was Black Manta in Aquaman. He's the new Candyman. Yaha Abdul Mateen a second. Yes, I was right. Yaha um, Abdul Mateen. Yes, Lord. And like Dr. Manhattan was also black. What? Like it was, it was, it was just extra. And I'm sure the show has flaws, but quite frankly, the representations of that show vastly outweigh <laughs> the problems that it had. It was just so good in so many different ways. And quite frankly, maybe I'm just biased because Regina King was beaten racist ass on screen and I lived for it. <laughs> <laughs> but that is definitely a good example for me 
more shows need to take Damon Lindoff's approach to storytelling. They just do. Granted, I would also say that my comment will tie into the next question as well, but I'm just curious. Do y'all have any examples of things that you saw over the last year or so that you think are either really good or really bad? I'm going to start. Um, I'm going to mix your last question into this question because I think, especially when it comes to gaming, disability is romanticized with perfection because we deal with the imagination. I think the most prominent examples that we have of this um, in gaming, because I was thinking about the good examples, but the good examples I came up with were people that were disabled, but kind of romanticized what it was to be disabled. I was thinking about Jack's Mortal Kombat 11 and how one of his endings freed the slaves. Um, I thought that was a bold move by another realm to do. I thought it was good to see. It caused a lot of salt in white people. They were so upset. They were so, they were so upset. Angry. And we really didn't care. But I think something speaks to Jax's story where he then thinks about, is it worth selling my soul to a higher power to save my child? And to watch his struggle, which we've watched since Mortal Kombat 2 when his arms got ripped off by Kano, um, to watch that struggle progress was just something that spoke to me when it came to the black male psyche. There was just something so accurate about that. You could not have got that without any type of, you know, some type of inclusion of a writer who understood. Seeing, you know, in certain scenes where he struggled even talking to Jackie after he sold out the Chronica, I just remember watching that and I was just like, yeah, I've seen I've seen this in real life with certain situations with regular dads and their kids. But um, disability is romanticized with perfection. I think that might be where we're missing the mark a little bit. I think we might need to start addressing the realistic approach. I, I know Avengers is about to do that with the character. I, I forget the name. Um, and there's another game that has um, a handicap aspect. But Anthony Mackie's performance as Takeshi Kovach and Alter Carvin, um, is another good example that I saw. I don't know if you guys watch Black Lightning, but I am in love with Christine Adams' performance as women, especially now that they're tackling drug addiction. And to see a strong, educated scientist who is so motivated by her work that she um, develops a flaw that causes a rift in her marriage family. Uh, and it becomes an obsession that she has to, you know, detox from because when we first introduced to Lynn, Lynn is like this perfect individual that keeps De Jefferson on track. Now she's on the other side of the foot and it's not because she's a superhero. She's a regular human being that's going through a crisis that's surrounded by metahumans, a, a world that she can't understand either. So she's fit in like, oh, I want to be a hero too. And now it's drove her to this drug addiction. I just think that show just covers dynamics. That, that are just needed for discussion. Those are my those are my favorites that I can think of. Um, I don't know if you guys have any, but yeah, those two right there. Um, Takeshi did. Oh my God, Anthony Mackie just did an amazing job. Yeah. It was oh, people it was were so, so good. angry. I heard that people said he, he he's not as good as the first guy. So I'm like, mm. it depends. I've read the books, so I get it. But he did an amazing job. I I. I he did an amazing job. That's all I can say. Chris, did you have something you want to add? Yeah, I have, I have just two real quick examples of good and a bad uh, for, say, Latinx male representation or, or Latinx men. Um, I keep waiting for the Latinx Marvel Cinematic Universe hero um, because it's not Gamora. You know, even though she's Latina, her character is not. Um, uh, Michael Pena is the comedy relief of a uh, you know of a couple of films, and he, he does what he does in an interesting way, but he kind of fills a lot of stereotypical stuff, kind of ex-con criminal, um, you know, does does that kind of stuff. And even in I think the second, it may have been the second uh, Ant Man, he's like, I just I just want a suit, even if it has no superpowers. Well, so like he's even the butt of a joke in the the Marvel in in, in the MCU. And it's very disappointing. Maybe maybe something will happen, you know, but we're already what, like 20 something films into that universe and we still don't have a very prominent, prominently identified Latinx character 
that is a superhero. So, um, so that's kind of like, even, even, even though I enjoy that character, um, you know, it's kind of a bad example. My good example of, of late is uh, from the new, relatively new Star Trek Picard uh, uh, show, which has an actor uh, uh, named Santiago uh, Cabrera. And he is, uh, he was born in Venezuela to Chilean parents and basically was like a world traveler growing up. He lived in London, he lived in Madrid, he lived in Romania, he lived in Canada. Uh, and he's the captain of his own ship in the show. And, uh, and his ship has like these like computer generated programs that look like people and it's him but it's like different versions of his identity. So in so one of the iterations, he's speaking in Spanish mostly. In another one, he has like a Scottish accent. And, and, I, and I just love the range of that character. Mm. Um, and it's something I've never seen, even though we've had Latinx actors before in the Star Trek universe, never seen it so, so boldly proclaimed in this show. I absolutely loved it. I think that's a, that's a really cool thing to do because the way they've conceived of that character is uh, he has different expressions of identity through like that computer program. Um, and he's a very nuanced character as well. He's, he's not the typical like Latino character that you might see. And, and he's an, like, he's not a red shirt. You know what I mean? Like he's not going to die in that episode. He's going to be here for a while. <laughs> so I think he is at the top of my list right now for like really intriguing characters that express Latinx identity and I want to see what they do with him. I love how you didn't say the Mandalorian, but I also know why you didn't say the Mandalorian. No, but I like that one too, you know, and Pedro Pascal is Latinx too, um, but he's in a helmet the entire time. And you, you know, Latinos don't exist in the Star Wars universe. Right. Right. Um, uh, in, I mean, in, they do. His character as in Star Trek Picard, his name is Cristobal Rios. Like he is, he is Latinx, right? So um, while I appreciate that in Star Wars, they're supposedly in a, you know, galaxy far, far away. So our I identity and racial categories shouldn't exist there. But I like that um, at least he has the lead, even though we can't really see him except for like one scene in the first season. And then uh, Shimba, Leticia, y'all got anything that you want to add? I, I perked up when Chris said Star Trek, because Star Trek Discovery has it's um, Sonique. Oh um, yes, um, yeah. It's my part. I love yeah. her. So I love her. Love her. She's she's my good and bad. My good because there's no one else like her, but my bad when I look at some of the storylines sometimes that they that they give her. Like, you know, I can't figure out, I know that she's obviously um, meant to be adopted by um, whose character? She's um, his sister. They adopted her because her parents seemingly died. I won't give it away for those who haven't watched it. But then there's this whole, well, she was brought up by Vulcan, so she can't show emotions. And we know that this idea of, you know, black women showing emotions, you only have one type of emotion that seems to be anger. So, you know, to have her, you know, be, be one of the most intelligent people on that cast, leading that show, but yet, you know, she has this background where she can't show emotion. And that's been her upbringing because she's, you know, she's human, but she's, you know, in between, but she's this, but she's that. And I thought, what a great character, but there's, there's been elements of her storyline that I found uh, just a bit disappointing, some of the things that she gets up to. Um, and I don't know whether they've announced season three, because, you know, we, we have a time lag in England with getting shows from, <laughs> from America. So I think we do. wait with bated breath when something, you know, something comes out. So I don't know if they've, they've announced that yet. But because um, I watched The Walking Dead for her. So for her to have her own show like that was, you know, amazing to me. But it, yeah, some of the writing has been a little bit disappointing. But yet yeah, that universe is quite, di you know, diverse. It had a swear word. It had, you know, two two men kissing and that whole storyline. So, you know, in some ways it's progressive, in other ways it's regressive. And then Leticia, do you have anything you wanna add? You guys kind of took all the good ones. <laughs> <laughs> um, though though I will say I feel like there is a plethora of things that are on streaming platforms which I have not had a chance to see. Um you know, in you real sex, sex education on Netflix. See, I haven't seen that, and I know that's a thing. Oh, good, Eric. You know? Eric. 
Eric. <laughs> Eric is everything. But I will I will say this. Um, granted, it's it's not within 2020, but it was uh, last year. Um, I fell in love with the passage on Fox. Okay. Um, and uh, you had the main uh, the main character Amy. Um, you know, young black girl who, like, again, like, I feel like when you have, like, what is good representation, you often end up with the, oh, but there's this nuance that they added, but you're also like, but we need nuance, but when they add nuance, it's still problematic, but we need nuance. <laughs> so, like, it's so complicated. The never-ending wheel. Because never never it's like, we don't want you to be perfect, but we kind of need you to be so the thing with um, Amy that I love about her, you know, she's a young black girl and she's she's intelligent, she's independent. She she still actually has the opportunity to be a little girl, which is very interesting um, because throughout the story, you know, um, you have the Mark Paul Gosselaar's character ends up in some ways becoming like her foster father, um, but you know, she's like twelve and she's allowed in that space in many ways in which she has a lot to take on to be taken care of to be looked after and one of the things that they talk about when it comes to you know you know young black children young black women young black girls specifically that they get adultified you know they're like you know they get to you know people put oh you're so big you're so this you're so that and don't allow them to be a child um so like i found that really interesting and then also um Unfortunately, her her mom has like died because of a drug overdose or something like that. So she's very much on her own, uh, you know, which is which is harmful. But what I found interesting about her character is that the way that she deals with people and the way that she deals with adults made sense to me. Like, oh, I don't trust you, so I'm gonna go left. Huh? You think you can mess with me? Not gonna happen. I'm a smart person, which I feel like many people have that kind of childhood of like. Yes, I am young, but I also am forced to be aware. And so that just felt very real to me when I watched it. Um, so yeah, that's my that's my good representation. With bad things tossed in. <laughs> With bad things tossed in. And no, you know, so so I was also thinking of um uh Rafe. Oh god, the 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 black female character in Picard. Yeah, um, is that her name? I, I I can't remember now. It's been a couple of months since I saw the show. I think you're right, though. <laughs> yeah, where she's really cool. She's really interesting. She's also a drug addict and a problematic mother. <laughs> Look, which brings me to question. Raffi. 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 Yeah, you were. Yeah, it was close. Yeah. <laughs> question number nine. So much of black storytelling comes out of the lens of pain and trauma. And I said, Shem, I'm referring to the lens of the United States. Perhaps in Britain it's different, and I don't. I, I love to talk about that. But while I understand the point, it's t times is literally like, damn y'all, can y'all associate us with anything else besides slavery, gangs, or the carceral state? As much as I love Sonequa Martin Green in you know Star Trek Discovery, let us talk about the fact that she was the first mutineer. She's the first murderer. Like she's literally a a, a prison inmate. The whole story hinges on her being like a prison inmate. The carceral state in the future where it's not even supposed to exist. I was so angry. And so I'm just like, do you think this is necessary as a place of connection for culture or has it just gotten disrespectful? Because for me, this is probably the biggest problem in all of Black creation that like the points of connection for it to be a quote unquote black story always seem to revolve around slavery, the gang or the carceral state. And like, we cannot seem to move. It's like, you can literally play degrees of separation with almost any black character in almost any black situation. It's so rare for them to have no connection that is not one of those three that it just comes out of left field. I mean, kind of like, I think the only thing I can think of is that movie the about the black sommelier um w uh that just came out on netflix i can't remember the name of it but it was literally about a black wine taster um and even then his like it's like his parents don't he his dad owns a barbecue shop or whatever food place barbecue and his father they want him to alfrey witter and they want him to run the restaurant and he's like no like i don't care about soul food i want to be a sommelier and like, I remember watching the trailer being like, 
okay, this is not, this is not what I expected, but I'm here for it. And like, that was the comment thread. I'm like, it was uh, the Black Lead page on Netflix. Everybody's comment underneath was, huh, are there Black sommeliers? Like, it was just the, the question. And folks was like, you made a whole movie about this? <laughs> and And it was just like, I feel like Netflix was just trying to be like, we're giving you something else. Like, yes, it's a black lead, and yes, they're a black, it's an all black cast, but it's not about slavery. So y'all <laughs> should be happy. It's about wine tasting. So like be happy. And I literally was like, is that enough? So that is my question to you guys. Can we is it possible to move off of one of these three points? I just want to throw something really quick. The three points that you added, well, outside of slavery, but like drug addiction, gangs, whatever. Those are also what they what they throw at white characters to make them interesting. So so like so I'm not saying that they don't that that is, that isn't specifically problematic when you have the other black character, but it's like that's what they throw in to make white characters interesting. So I'm like, y'all need to add something else to the sauce to make us interesting. <laughs> you know? I mean, I admit, wait, what was it? The cloak and dagger. I was actually shocked when the white girl was the drug addict. And I was just like, because I didn't see that coming at all. Like, I actually really enjoyed that part about Cloak and Dagger, that it was flipped, that the white girl was homeless and that she was the one that had nothing. And the black dude was in this very affluent, rich family. And like, it was not at all what I expected. And I think they, they did that on purpose, obviously. But it still comes back to police brutality. The whole show revolves around police brutality. So I'm like, here we go. I'm just wondering, is it an inescapable void that Black storytelling just cannot seem to move out of? Well, I don't think it's inescapable. It's just the way that things have been allowed to be. Um, one of the difficulties I think that we're confronted with is, and I've heard this in some of our previous answers to earlier questions, is, you know, there's this particular representation, but it's not perfect. Right, it still has this, it still has that. The reason we perseverate on that notion of perfection is because we don't have an array of, of wide ranging roles that we see ourselves in, right? It's, it's, it's what you're saying, right? It's like, we tend to see black representation in these particular areas, whether it has to do with incarceration or has to do with the drug trade. We even talked about that in, uh, with Moonlight, right? It's like, well, why did it have to be like that? And, you know, if we had, you know, films uh, and, and television shows that showed just a, just a vast array of representation of the Black community, we wouldn't, we wouldn't fixate so much on perfection. Because I guarantee you, white culture does not perseverate on, well, this role wasn't perfect. It kind of got, you know, white culture, but it still showed him or her like this. Like, they don't do that. Why? Because they have a billion roles to draw upon. And so, you know, this is a, this is a, a situation of the industry's own making, and it, has, it goes back to what you were saying before. It has been allowed to exist, right, and, and, and to continue that way. And you know, now with COVID-19 kind of shutting things down, uh, maybe this allows opportunities for more uh, films that we see in like streaming platforms, which tend to be much more daring, uh, even if imperfect, right? Than like the major film studios or even the publishing, the, the big five publishing uh, houses uh, for, for the publishing industry. So, um, yeah, I mean, I, I, you know, everything we've been talking about, you know, helps undo that that system, but but here we're discussing. Well, this is a great character, but it's still imperfect, you know. Yeah, but wh wh where is there a perfect representation of an identity in fiction or film? It does not exist because those characters embody uh, just a small uh, sliver of experience, whether imagined or you know adapted. And the, the issue, the underpinning issue is, is that, that broad reach of, of um, representation via expression in narrative storytelling. I mean, I, I, as you were talking, I was thinking of Regina King and I was like, did she have a point of connection to this and Watchmen? I don't think she did. Like she was a black teacher who had a bakery well, <laughs> she had a front of a bakery 
uh, but was secretly a cop. Um, I'm like, does she have anything with slavery? No. Like, I don't know. I guess like her her father has a connection to slavery, but she does not. I don't know if that counts. <laughs> I don't know if that counts. She has nothing to do with the carceral state. So I'm like, maybe, you know, but also, like, you know, Watchmen is an alternate universe, you know, that takes place outside of the timeline of regular people. Um, but, but just real quick, just an, just an add on there. You know, the other thing too is what our audience is comfortable with. Right. What do they recognize? Oh, well, you know, they watch, you know, the evening news and whenever they see people of color, it tends to be involved in crime or, you know, things like that. So, you know, it's, it, it seems natural for these story writers and storytellers who have no real connection to the communities to say, well, I've seen, you know, black people represented, you know, it, you know, whether through um, the legal system or because of drugs. So that seems a, like a, like a natural, believable fit for this story and it requires a kind of due diligence like people have to educate themselves and know that you know the black community is very diverse in its experience in its traditions in its cultural heritage and what we tend to get is kind of this very narrow slice which is where we get the stereotypes and i was gonna say i mean you kind of led into the last part which is the last question which is what comes next uh you know it's like what what does the industry need to do to move the needle forward, to engage broader audiences with more diverse storytelling. How can we ensure eight flavors of blackness in the world? So, you know, that kind of speaks to what you were just talking about, you know, which is that, you know, it's like we need, I mean, is it, I guess the question is, is it really as simple as just more of everything? <laughs> is that the, is that really the answer? I want to say, yeah. I want to say more of everything would be great. Um, <laughs> Especially in, we kind of talk about these tropes, typecast things, if you will. Um, there are some hidden heroes. There's um, Alex Withers, who plays a genius on The Runaways, who's the son of parents who were criminals as a part of Pride, the organization that, you know, was kind of controlling people with powers. And then he kind of breaks free from that and begins to gain his own identity in a very intellectual manner. And he actually rebels against his parents. So we see a different aspect of what the dynamic is between a wealthy, Black, established, functional family that's hiding a secret. And then that secret gets exposed. We have um, Lucas Tillman, who played on The Class, and I know we constantly see the gangster aspect, but he actually was an imposter. He acted like he was the leader of a gang on Deadly Class. But when it came down to him actually killing someone, he never did, and he was scared to do so. So I think when I say more of everything, I think we just need to make it more apparent. Um, you know, nobody really brings up Gina Torres' performance as Jessica Pearson on Suits. That's a great example of how we kind of circumvent a gangster narrative. We're now tipping into a successful black woman in a law firm who has to deal with the layout of a white man who comes into her job and is an imposter lawyer. She's dealing with a white collar crime that ends up removing her from her entire uh, life experience because she had lost track of where she was being, you know, a lawyer. So we had um, so many diverse pieces of representation. In gaming, we don't really see it that much. I think that's where I'm angry, especially with um, representation in fighters. I think fighters as a whole are missing the mark when it comes to this. I, I applaud Guilty Gear for bringing in, um, oh my God, her name escapes me, The Bride. Um, her name escapes me to death, but she came into the game looking for husband. She was a black girl. Um, so I just thought that was great to see something different, just a woman who wanted to get married, you know, um, and, and was of color. And um, I think a lot of tropes, especially in fighters, they missed the mark, like Birdie from Street Fighter Alpha 2, who was a muscular British black male. But then when we see him again in Street Fighter 5, he's fat, out of shape, eating donuts, fighting vain, trying to get away from the criminal organization that he came from. There was no, there was no really, uh, there was no progression with Eric. You just saw him in 1998, and then you just magically saw him again in 2016, and it was just like, 
what? You know what I mean? So it's just like, I think when we become more apparent, it just needs to be a, a little bit more concise. And we just need to make the availability a wide conversation. If that, I hope that's making sense, what I'm trying to say here. I just don't think the conversation is available enough for us to say, you know, um, where are the other Annalise Keatings or where are the other um, Olivia Pope's per se, that kind of like take what the normal tropes are that we see and kind of give it a bit of a twist. I feel like the twist is kind of like progression out of it. It's not necessarily all the way out of it, but I think if we make these things and these small movements more available, more available, they move the posts toward transparency and transformation. Shim, Leticia? Um, you go. <laughs> um, well, I was gonna say that um... I agree with everything that's been said. I think what's happening at the moment, probably amongst um, my group and people I know is that they're kind of fed up with the industries as they are. And so since um, this recent campaign for you know, Black Lives Matter, I'm not saying the campaign is recent, I'm saying this resurgence of it. Um, they, I've been invited to 20, 30 different Facebook groups of people who want to set up different industries away from the mainstream ones that we have so they're saying you know let's support our own industries let's support our own you know audiences and it's the first time i suppose that i've seen collectively a space where people are saying well i have um i own a, a black um fruit and vegetable store i i own you know a, a black smoothie company so the people around me which i've never seen before are saying yeah we don't want to engage with the industry as it is um, because it doesn't work for us. And it's the first time I'm seeing so much frustration that people are saying, let's not engage with it. So I'm not necessarily saying that that's where I fall, but I think I'm seeing more and more of that. People just saying, why do we, why are we trying to change something that can't be changed and why we're we not building something for ourselves? You know, they keep referring to Black Wall Street. Uh, they keep referring to so many things that are available that just don't have the same um, success. There's a, there's a lady that set up kind of her version of Amazon and she's trying to get support for that saying you know why are we giving our money to Amazon especially the way they've treated employees during um, COVID and the conditions that people have to work under you know I have a similar company that is more ethical so I think there's a discussion there about whether people still want to engage with these industries and there is a there's a lot of talk especially in the UK saying actually no we want our own that actually goes into what I was thinking, um, just thinking about like kind of the industries themselves and the things that do, you know, would need to change. Because the fact is that um, not only does, you know, white supremacy protect itself, it also perpetuates itself. Like there is very little um, outside of like the immediate moment for many things, there's very little incentive to change. Power gives up nothing willingly um you know that has to be forced on that has to be you know pulled from so if you're talking about the various media industries you're also talking about yes the olivia popes and the annette keatings which also talking about like the shonda rhymes you're also talking about you know uh you know lena Waite. you're talking about the people who um who are writing who are producing but then you go into development and you go into who does the green light you're talking about financing you're talking about like the entire industry with not only have to have more diverse ver more diverse voices in it whether it's the agents and the managers but then you're talking about what philosophy do those people bring in because you don't want to create a new industry or have new people in there and they are using the same systems that got us into this process in the first place right. um so for instance i was um i was on another conversation talk about, uh, with uh, michael bobbitt who uh, runs, um, I think it's the New Rep Theater in Boston. And so he is a black head of a white institution, but he's saying, I am talking about essentially ripping apart so many aspects that we're doing. So we're talking about getting rid of the subscription um, financial format. We're talking about getting rid of, you know, um, the different prices of ticketed seats so that it is, you know, equal across the board. Like we're talking about like, fundamentally changing things. Um, and I think pushing industries and society in a way that when they say, oh, we want to go back to normal, normal doesn't exist anymore. 
your world is gone and we are building something new. So I think taking the industry that exists and really dismantling it, I think is part of the story, but I think um, we also make a good point of, you know, building our own. And I know that that's been a, that's been a, a narrative I've heard from for a long time and even my grandparents' time in the 60s building our own um, and and working with that. I think it's one of the things that's possible, but it's one of the things that's challenging. And then also when you build your own, there's also this understanding that, you know, these industries have been around for hundreds of years, if not thousands. So they will have a larger reach um, than you would if you're building something from scratch. But that being said, if you change your definition of, of success to, I just want to influence these 10 people deeply, as opposed to, I want to influence a million people in a very shallow way, then I think maybe that's another way we can, we can move forward into, you know, how, how do we define our set for ourselves when we're, when we're independent? Let me, let me, let me just I think add. Oh, go ahead. Let me just jump in real quick because I know we're, we're kind of probably out of time. Yep. But one of the things that frustrates me is like, why don't we have more, you know, writers who are of color, black, Latina, and so forth? Why don't we have more producers? Why don't we have more directors? And then, but in the same breath, I, I will hear people saying, well, you know, degrees in the humanities don't matter. Um, you know, let's, let's cut this arts program. Right. Um, Right, like how, like, how are we going to get storytellers? How are we going to get people who want to make film, who want to put on and produce theater, if we're cutting those programs, right? And like my experience going into graduate school, studying literature, studying storytelling, um, like my white peers were often saying, "Why am I even doing this? People shouldn't even do this. There's no jobs here." And you know, I heard professors say, "Well, you know, the humanities are dying." Um, you know, there are going to be jobs. And I, and I was like, I feel like I just got here. I, I, feel, I, feel, I feel like, you know, people of color just got here. And now you're saying it's over? Like the party's over already? Right. You know, and, and so, um, so wherever I can, I try to push back on this idea that, you know, storytelling doesn't matter. You shouldn't pursue. We need people to tell these stories. We need people to tell their stories. Right. And, um, and however we can support those um, efforts that's kind of our charge when some of us, my, I include myself in this, who have kind of achieved a level uh, where I can like open doors for other people. I want to do that. I want to create book series. I want to see if I can help, you know, kind of like create an opportunity for someone to tell stories or to someone to study something. Um, so, you know, part of it is just like, how do we do, uh, how, 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 how do we take action to make sure that there are people um, who can speak with that authenticity of our identities, right? Because if we leave it to others, they're going to get it wrong. And, and that's what's so frustrating. I, I, you know, whenever I hear, well, the humanities are dead, but, you know, it's not going to make you any money. And I, and I hear that. I, I just, I, you know, I just want to just like, I, sometimes I feel like I just want to just give up because it's like, no, like this is exactly the time where we can make interventions because white culture is already done with this. But like, we still have stories to tell. Look, that's the only reason that I'm in school right now. <laughs> so, like I said, I firmly believe, you know, as a person who is both Black and disabled, you know, I'm, I, you know, my background is in storytelling, it's in creative writing, and I'm like, I'm just getting started. You know, the work I'm trying to do, I, <laughs> I'm just getting started. So, you know, maybe, maybe y'all are tired of it. The world has enough Shakespeare. That is true. But now it's time for the next version of it. Um, and so, yeah, I just, um, I wanted to thank y'all for coming. This has been really, really wonderful. Um, I mean, yeah, I hope that people who watch this podcast or excuse me, video cast, um, uh, can, you know, really get something out of it. I think we've had so many discussions and a lot of stuff that we've talked about today has been just amazing. Um, so I just wanted to give you guys a moment. If people wanted to follow you on social media, um, if you have a social media channel, um, I wanted to give you guys an opportunity to uh, let people know how they can follow you. So um, I know some of you have some and maybe some of you don't. So um, if anybody wants to shout out a handle. Uh, just real quick, uh, my website that I usually blog stuff there is thechrisgonzalez.com. Um, and uh, on social media, I, uh, my handle is my name without vowels, so C-H-R-S-G-N-Z-L-Z. -Z. Um, and I also have um, a podcast that I launched recently 
Uh, it's called Hospitable Imaginations, and it really just looks at how stories work. And, you know, maybe people can find me there if they're interested. Okay, great. Thank you. Um, anyone else? Yeah, no? Yeah. I mean, uh, if people want to follow me, uh, I'm Letitia on on uh, Instagram and uh, Twitter. Uh, my handle is uh, Leticia Creates, so that's L-E-T-I-C-I-A underscore creates. Um, and I will be, you know, posting about different issues, but also uh, some of the new projects as uh, as they come to fruition. Okay, great. Thank you. And JC, Shimba? You have a handle you want to? No, you good? Okay. Oh, you, no, no. I can go. Um, you can follow me at JC Calloway W. The only I am active on right now is Facebook because Gaypock is in the process of working on a podcast and a lot of social media branding. So I'm kind of limited on all other platforms. Um, and there's also been, um, I don't know if you heard in the fighting game community, but um, used to be a tournament organizer and I'm kind of assisting with that branch and there's been a lot of sexual allegations going on so um, all my other platforms are cut I'm actually in a discord with tournament organizers around the world we're trying to come up with a code of conduct policy and some reformations that will hopefully help benefit the community at large um, but you guys can only catch me on Facebook um, my Facebook group is GAPOC gamer ally people of color gamer with a Y um, it's nothing provocative or out of control. We keep tight regulations and we have a lot of Afrocentric conversation um, around a lot of different issues. And we, we just want more contributors that will be able to come to the narrative. So if you're an ally of the community, if you're homosexual, black and a gamer and you're stuck in one of those white gamer groups and you don't know where you can, you know, come home to try our group, come, you know, to the cacao and check us out and have a good time. And, uh, really just get into your element and get comfortable with things that we talk about within the nerd. Thank you. And uh, yeah, like I said, for me, uh, I am on uh, Facebook under my name. Um, I'm also on Twitter uh, at DRC Charrington. Uh, so spelled like a chair, <laughs> C-H-I-R-I-N-G-T-O-N. Uh, and um, yeah, it has been great to have everybody here. Thank you again so much for having your time. And uh, yeah. See you guys next time. Thank you.